Tracy just sent over the uh, questions for the public witnesses. We still have this one more that just got sent in the last five minutes. I'm just gonna do that in real time. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to set up the Facebook stream now, and then um, I'll let you know when it's done. And then you guys just let me know when we're ready.
right. Let me give it 30 more seconds. Good afternoon, Councilman Boyd. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, I'm Treyon White, uh, Ward A Council Member and Chair of the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs. Uh, today is Thursday, January 27th, 2022. We are meeting remotely using the Zoom platform. The time is now 12.01 p.m. And I'm calling to order this public hearing on the agency oversight for the Department of Re Recreations, also known as DPR. Uh, today's hearing will have both public witnesses and government witnesses. Uh, the committee has also received written testimony for people who are unable to participate in the hearing today. Uh, written testimony provided by the committee will be a part of the hearing record. Uh, the mission of the Department of Parks and Recs uh, is to promote health and wellness, conserve the natural environment, and provide universal access to parks and recreation services. As a part of the services, DPR supervises recreations, uh, community centers, parks, athletic fields, playgrounds, spray parks, tennis courts, community gardens, dog parks, aquatic facilities, and features. Um, as a former football coach, I know the importance of how recreation activities uh, help our youth to develop uh, both discipline um, and work ethics uh, to become responsible adults. I also have seen, and also a former employee of the Department of Parks and Recs. Uh, it's, it is also important to, uh, to know that uh, DPR touches all individuals, including dogs in the district. I look forward to hearing from the progress of the Department of Parks and Recs and hear from the public witnesses about where we need to be held more accountable and ensure we're giving the best quality service here in the District of Columbia. Um, before I go to my first witness, um, let me go to our at-large council member, uh, Christina Henderson for open remarks if you have any. Um, yes, thank you, Councilmember White. I'll, I'll be really brief. Thank you so much for holding this hearing today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, you know, the Department of Parks and Rec, especially in this past year, has played a, crit a critical role in ensuring that our families had access to safe recreational programming um, and just an outlet, uh, frankly, as, you know, families were going through a lot. Um, due to the pandemic, though, we know that there were limited slots available and a variety of their activities, including the day camps, the summer camps, et cetera. And so I'm looking forward to learning today from DP, excuse me, from DPR. Um, how they plan to restore um, the slots and programmatic activity to pre-pandemic levels to reduce some of the wait lists. I also want to check in on several of the investments uh, that were included in the budget to ensure that residents um, have access to equitable access to dog parks, specifically in Ward 7, um, and learn more about the timeline for completion for some of the projects like the Therapeutic Rec Center, and then checking in on a couple of playground renovations. Um, thank you for allowing me to give a brief opening, and I look forward to the public witness testimony. Thank you so much. As I call the first a panel of witnesses, um, they will be promoted. I see some of them are already coming on. Uh, you will have a maximum of three minutes to testify. Uh, public witnesses who are elected to represent the advisory neighbor commission uh, in their official capacity will have five minutes. Or if you're presenting on behalf of an organization. So the first we have Core Masters Bury Recreation Recreation Wish List Committee. Martin Wales. Alan Ray. And Mary Coyne. And help me pronunciate your name if I got it wrong. Miss Bury, are you here? Yep. Yes, I, I am. Okay, will you be giving testimony without coming on screen? I'm on screen, I thought. I don't I don't okay. see you. Okay. Can there you, you see are. me now? Hello. Hi. Hello. Good seeing you. You want me to start? Sure. Okay. You doing all right? Uh pray. I mean, I'm ups and downs, but it's, <laughs> I'm blessed nonetheless. Okay. So Chairperson White and members of the Committee on Recreation and Youth Affairs, my name is Cora Masters Barry. 
and I'm pleased to testify in my capacity as founder and chief executive of the Recreation Wishlist Committee and the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center. My testimony is intended to highlight the continued success of our partnership with the Department of Parks and Recreation and the impact of our joint efforts in fiscal 2021 on the residents of Ward 8 uh, and our city. Um, you know, we 2021 and 2020 were pretty tough. So uh, we're a nonprofit organization and our overall goal is to improve the quality of recreation opportunities for underserved youth in our city, especially in Ward 8 and over the 25 years across the city we've done, when we were founded, we've done everything from refurbished base, baseball fields, tennis and basketball courts uh, in our own backyard, such as Bald Eagle and all the way across town, such as Chevy Chase Recreation Center. Um, and so we've done that and we have had a large amount of success in doing that, but our focus in the last 15, 20 years have been the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. And I think everybody will agree, it's a state of the art tennis and learning facility that features a library, five classrooms, computer lab, fitness center and a community meeting room, serving tens of thousands of local children for the last 19 to 20 years. Given the COVID pandemic this past year has been particularly challenging for us. However, we are pleased to report in concert with amazing partners such as DPR under the leadership of Delano Hunter, the tennis center has been able to continue to serve Ward 8 communities. And I'm telling you that was a challenge, but we met it. One of the things we did as it relates to health concerns, I think uh, uh, council member, you remember you were a part of that. We staged a, um, a uh, vaccination site where we, read, where we vaccinated close to um, a thousand people from Ward 8. Uh, and that was our response. We also gave our meals and PPE equipment during the pandemic. So we figured though, even though we didn't have a lot of activity on the inside of the building, the, what we could do is reach out to the community and that was our way of doing that while we all try to get through this crisis together. Um, we now have restarted our academic programs based on funding some of the support from across the city. You've been a part of our, red, our, our galas and all of that. And just for the record, when we have those galas council member, those galas, are to raise money for what we call unrestricted funds. We get, get, we get grants for restricted funds for our education program, but there's not a lot of money out there. If our kids need to go play tennis in another state, you know, being black people and poor people, we don't, we don't have a level playing field. Our job is to level the playing field so our kids can compete anywhere they wanna go. They can compete with the best of them all across the country. So a lot of the money that you all see us raise is to make sure that our kids are equal, equally and equitably prepared to compete uh, both in and out off the court. Uh, we have a tutoring program. We have a, a STEAM STEM program. We have a Blacks, a, a very famous program called Blacks and Wax, uh, which we were able to do virtually, which I really didn't think we were gonna be able to do, but the DPR got with us and we used their communication people the people at the ARC helped us with the production and we did a production in the middle of COVID of Blacks and Wax. Uh, so that is not possible if we did not have the kind of partnership we had uh, with uh, DPR. As a vision for the future, I just wanna add that we're about to do an extension. Uh, we're in the process of doing it now for those asked, why do we need it and why are we doing it? Uh, the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center is, a, is a, a world renowned facility. People come from all over the world and, and talk about how ours stand out. We are able to accommodate people uh, that come in from as far as, as uh, Paris, France, when they come in for the open. As, and also we are home for George Washington University tennis program and UDC's tennis program. We have a long waiting list of people who want to access our facility in the winter. And we have children that we're trying to serve uh, in a very comprehensive way and we don't have the space. So when we expand, we will expand to not only include it and accommodate the, the, the members of our commu immediate community because that's always our top priority, but will also put us on the map as a world-class facility where we can have international and national tournaments Hence, council member bringing the world to Ward 8. And we've done that in different ways, but this will put us on the map in a way that, um, well, we'll be right on up there with uh, 
Australia and everybody else. So I'm excited that, but for junior tournaments, for our young people. So we're bringing people to the urban community as opposed to our kids always having to go out to the suburbs. So that is one of the things. So we have need, we need more space for our communities to have their events that they wanna have for their various activities, their repasses, their baby showers, all of those things, community meetings. So I wanna thank you for that support, Council Member Wright, and thank the Department of Parks and Recs for being such a great partner and, and working with us. One, to provide programs, two, to help improve our tenants, uh, our outreach, and three, for being there when we are ready to expand and give more opportunities to our communities. And so that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, I'm here. I'm sitting, I'm not at home, I'm in New York, but I'm having fun. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll come back to you in a moment. Okay. Um, now we have uh, Martin Wales. Uh, good, uh, I guess we're on the afternoon. Good afternoon, Council Member White and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Martin Wells. Um, I have three children in public school. Uh, they currently attend Wilson High School. And I'm on the board of directors of the nonprofit Capital Community Partners. Council Member White, you may have recall we've uh, instituted the Feed the Feeder series. You've attended some of our events in the past. I would like to say that we are now happy um, to have been reassigned to Ward 8. Our headquarters is located in the Navy Yard, and we look forward to working with you as our uh, representative on the, um, the council. Uh, with respect to the um, DPR oversight testimony, um, while we have, um, and hopefully you, you got a copy of my, my testimony, and, and as such, I won't read it word for word, but while we have a um, great number of parks in DC uh, maintained and managed by DPR, um, the Billing that we're the number one park city in the United States does not match with the level of maintenance and amenities provided by the parks. Um, you know, one of the, we benefit from the work of Benjamin Banneker, who um, established the park system in, in DC. Um, but I find very few parks in the District of Columbia that are maintained to a high standard. There's very few parks with restrooms that can be used. If, um, if you're renting space um, through the permit system, then you have to supply your own outhouses. There's no running water, toilet, flush toilets, that type of thing that are found throughout the United States and other parks. I'd like to point out that I've been in communication with DPR for more than two years on some trees that were planted on the field of Jefferson um, Middle School, it's a DPR park, by Casey Trees with the permission of DPR, what these trees are going to do is they're going to grow and then impede on the playing field. DPR promised a year ago, after a one year worth of communication, to remove them. They still haven't been removed. They continue to grow. And um, now they're tying the removal of the trees to the renovation of the field. There was 1.5 million in the budget this year for renovation of Jefferson Field. I talked to DPR probably two, three months ago to find the status. They don't know when it's gonna be renovated. So they can't say they're the number one park system in the United States with so many maintenance issues. Um, I'd also like to highlight again for you um, the bill that Council Member Pinto, um, the legislation that Council Member Pinto has drafted on um, having council oversight for leasing of our public fields. Um, I've attached to my testimony a list of 11 or 12 public fields that have leases from 50, 85, even 999 years. There's a field in, in Ward 8, the Ark Field, that's leased for 999 years. Um, Long-term contracts like these need to have council oversight. It just can't be through fiat of, um, of the mayor. Um, there, there just needs to be public oversight on the public assets. And then finally, I see my time is out, but I will mention, as I've talked to you before, and this kind of ties in with Ms. Uh, Masters-Berry's uh, testimony, 
that we really need a multiplex in DC, similar to the St. James complex in Springfield, Virginia, or similar to the Wayne Curry complex in Prince George's. There's two great places for a multiplex, one either on uh, Oklahoma Avenue at the fields near RFK Stadium or else in Anacostia, um, which is in Ward 8, uh, Anacostia Park. Um, you could easily put a, a complex there. These complexes are one roof with running tracks and basketball courts and tennis courts and ice rinks and uh, aquatic centers and gymnastic centers. Uh, and I encourage you to go look at the St. James complex in Springfield if you ever get a chance or the- hey, Mr. Wills, you look at the time. Thank you so much for your time. I've submitted my written testimony. Thank you, appreciate you. Alan Ray. Everybody hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you. Great. Well, thank you, Council Member White. Thank you, everybody. My name is Alan Ray. I'm the managing arborist at Casey Trees. As some of you may be aware, Casey Trees' mission is to restore, enhance, and protect the tree canopy of our nation's capital. And we do this by planting trees, advocating for the protection of trees and green space, and teaching residents of all ages about the value of trees. Casey Trees commends the staff of the Department of recreation on their efforts to provide our city's residents with the parks and green spaces that enhance our quality of life and are critical to our physical and mental health. During the pandemic, it became clear that these spaces are not just nice to have, they are necessary to our well-being of our children and our communities. Casey Trees works hand in hand with DPR on many fronts, from educating programming to tree plantings. Uh, we, we see firsthand the good work that they do and are renewing our MOU with DPR in order to continue this successful partnership. This year, we jointly engaged community members to meet in your park style events and provided our TreeWise Junior Urban Forester program as an enhancement to youth summer camps. The program is rich in connecting school aged children to their natural environment through trees. When we teach younger generations about the value of trees and the green space, we instill a love of nature that ensures our city's tree filled legacy continues. In addition to the youth programming, Casey Trees conducts community tree plantings and tree care events at DPR facilities. Casey Tree has worked with DPR over the last year to conduct tree plantings and tree care at Riggs LaSalle Rec Center, Tacoma Rec Center, Dakota Playground, and Oxen Run Park, just to name a few. We look forward to planting trees this spring at six additional sites and at the Langdon Park Recreation Center to engage community members in invasive control, tree care, and a creation of a forest path. Recently, the district acquired new land cover data that showed from 2015 to 2020, our city's tree canopy decreased by 1% with the largest decrease seen in our city's public lands and parks. So now more than ever, it is critical that we prioritize protecting and enhancing our city's green spaces and tree canopy. We strongly commend DPR's goals in the Ready to Play Master Plan, particularly their commitment to promoting climate resilient and environmentally sustainable parks and recreational facilities that provide safe, accessible, and inclusive access to nature and recreational opportunities. The Joy Evans Therapeutic Rec Center and the Fort Lincoln Park Theodore Hagen's Cultural Center are great examples of park plans that prioritize preserving and enhancing tree canopy and include innovative biophilic designs that connect our residents to the healing power of nature. When we invest in our parks and rec centers, we invest in our community. And when we invest in our community, we build a stronger DC. This coming year, we should increase the investments made to support DPR, particularly to ensure that they have adequate staffing and resources to create and implement green and sustainable park designs. Our parks are meeting places and it means for respite in chaotic times. They bring diverse communities together and create a sense of place. They're natural assets that increase the health and enhance the quality of life for all DC residents. Thank you all. Thank you. Now we hear um, Mary Cohn. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, again, my name is Mary Coyne, and I'm here representing the Citizens Association of Georgetown, also known as CAG, and I want to talk about the Jellof Recreation Center. Uh, we at CAG, actually all of Georgetown, are just delighted that the Recreation Center is going to be renovated in the near future. Um, there are really many things about the Perkman, Perkins Eastman concept proposal that we like a lot. There may be some tweaks that we'd like to offer. Uh, so we'd really like to work closely and cooperatively with the DPR and others on, on this really important uh, project. Um, 
What I wanted to mention is that while we understand that the renovation of Georgetown, excuse me, of Jellup, uh, well done is gonna take time. Uh, we, we ask you to remember that Jellup, both the recreation center and the fields, is very heavily used by the community, including the nearby schools. And we just wanna urge you to do everything that you can to keep Jellup and its fields open during the renovation and construction, and if possible to accelerate the permitting and the construction schedule in a way that's consistent, of course, with achieving an excellent end result. Um, so thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Lauren Bill is here, uh, so we're going to go ahead and go to you, Lauren. Hi there. Can you can you hear me? Yes, and I saw that you were transitioning out. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that, but go ahead. We'll talk about that later. Do I get five minutes because I'm here for an organization? I'm just... Okay, so who's that, Kim? Um, yeah, we agreed to give agencies and organizations five minutes. So, yeah, that's probably, I feel bad now. Uh, we had a few organizations before that didn't get five minutes. Yeah, you didn't cut anybody off, though. You were good. <laughs> um, all right, great. So, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, first of all, really happy to be here um, at this hearing. Um, as you are probably aware, DC Greens advances health equity by building a just and resilient food system here in DC. Um, I am the executive director and co-founder, Lauren Beal. Um, and uh, Councilmember Henderson, it's also a pleasure to testify in front of you as well. Um, DC Greens is involved in a lot of projects that work collaboratively with city agencies, um, including the produce prescription program that we run, um, support we give for school food. Um, we've been uh, helping to bring together conversations about uh, prison food, um, helping to work on the No Senior Hungry legislation. But I'm really here today uh, to talk about the well at Oxen Run. Um, I just want to say how grateful we are for the partnership with DPR, uh, the team that we've been working with, uh, Watani Hatcher, Josh Singer, C Katie Raywalt, they have been incredible. Uh, this is a team that truly cares about the shared work that we're doing and shows up every day um, as thought partners and as supporters of, of this work. Um, so just wanted to go on the public record to express my gratitude for them. Um, also wanted to provide an update. Um, as you know, the Well at Oxen Run is something that we have been planning together with uh, the Bellevue, Congress Heights, and Washington Highlands communities for about four years now. And we have successfully reached our $2.1 million capital campaign goal. Uh, we are in the midst of construction and the, um, the project is on track to open uh, in June. So we're so excited and certainly hope that, um, well, expect really that Council Member White, you will be there at the ribbon cutting with us and uh, Council Member Henderson, certainly hope you will join us as well. Um, and in fact, some of those seeds that we planted at the ground opening even, you know, bore fruit, uh, even without any kind of um, active cultivation. So we know this is fertile ground and we're, we're so excited to see what, uh, what it brings for the community. Um, I also wanted to just express gratitude, Councilmember White, for your investment in this budget of $500,000 to be able to create a hub for this kind of wellness in, um, in Oxen Run Park. Uh, it's our hope that these funds will be able to sustain a uh, really full staffing plan for the farm, as well as be an opportunity to transfer resources to some of our uh, community-based partners like the Friends of Oxen Run and the Green Scheme. So very hopeful that this can be an ongoing allocation in the future um, as, a, as a signal of the deep partnership that we know this project will continue to be with DPR. Um, also just wanted, since Council Member Henderson, you're here with us, I wanted to thank you for um, advancing the Give Snap a Raise Act. Um, I want you to know that DC Greens is a strong supporter of this and we and the Fair Food for All DC Coalition are at your service as you uh, work to continue to advance this very important piece of legislation. Um, finally, um, just had a question. Um, I know that Jaron Hill Lockridge, uh, the director of the well, 
is very excited about the possibility of tying in the well with the outdoor gym that is planned on the, the adjacent parcel in Oxen Run Park and um, would love an update on where that project stands and you know to make sure that we can really integrate this as a, a corridor for wellness um, for that community. And I'll stop there, thanks so much. Thank you. So I'll jump back to Madam Core Masters Barry. Um, Ms. Barry, are you still here? Ms. Barry? Yep, I'm just trying to get back on camera. Okay, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You talked about this extension, uh, which, is, which will be located at Valley Avenue, correct? Yes. Now, is, and now, have we acquired that property from the federal government yet to build something there? Yeah, well, originally, when the Southeast Tennyson Learning Center was built, it was for those two pieces of land. What we had originally, the original plan when we built the center was to have the tennis on one side. It was during the period of time, I'm sorry, this thing keeps coming back, that uh, they were um, trying to expand uh, African American and, 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 and urban children into non traditional sports like tennis and golf. And so that part was supposed to be like a, uh, a hitting range and it was all laid out for that. The architectural designs are there, but the funding didn't end up being there to do that. Then in the renovations, we were supposed to then in um, 20, 2015, 2014, uh, we were supposed to then again do what we're trying to do now. But again, the funding uh, limited it. But okay. yes, the answer to your question is yes, it is, it is earmarked for the, the South Campus of the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center. We're just now getting around to it. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't see that originally, I to go back. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for sharing that. And let me ask you this, what is different with the new facility? Um, what's gonna be different programmatic wise, size wise, structure, uh, amenities from the old, no, I'll say old, but the- But the other one. Other facility. Yeah. Uh, well, number one, we're going to add additional indoor courts. They're at a premium in this city, and it is a—I mean, in this in this this in this area, the DMV. Um, it is a great resource, a re, uh, a financial resource for the city. Uh, people come from wide and allowed wide, wide and far to play tennis on the inside during these nine months of cold weather, and we make a lot of money. And it also gets a chance to expand our evening program for our kids because a lot of times at seven o'clock, the kids have to leave off the court because the adults come in. And some of the kids need special training and all because they have tournaments and they have special needs and we're not able to do that. So it'll expand the indoor court, then the outdoor court will also give us an opportunity to serve many more children than we've been able to serve in addition to qualify us as an international site. We will also have a uh, site that's within that indoor court that we can transform into an event, 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 because everybody wants to come to the Southeast Tennyson Center, Center and have their events, but when they find out how much money it takes to cover the floor and do all the stuff that people see us do, it's cost prohibitive. This new facility will give us an opportunity to open it up to the community for their special events without costing anything. And if costing a minimum of cost, I mean, it costs thousands of dollars to use the tennis court at the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. So if you're outside and you want to do something for your family reunion or repass or shower, all the things that our people and more they want to do, now we have, we'll have a facility where they can do it and do it at a little cost and it'll be a quality place for them to have their events as well as their community programs and, 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 and meeting. Got it. And additional parking, which we need badly. And let me ask you, and lastly, because I know we're taking up a lot of time, we have a lot of witnesses, but I was concerned about staffing. Uh, what's the vision to uh, add additional staff for this additional facility and how many uh, FTEs do you envision needed for that space? Well, you know, that's a good question because we really have not looked at it. We look at that as an extension of who we are and extending our programs over, but if the, there will be an additional staff need, but it'll be around the issue of coaches. And we're already down coaches because we've had, you know, because of COVID and other things, they've lost two or three different coaches. So we have to rebuild to where we were. We're at four now and we're trying to get back to seven so that we can have a lot more uh, 
uh, ability to, our kids need more than they're getting and they can't really compete adequately with other surrounding tennis facilities because our coaching is, is, in, is inadequate. But I'm working with the director and we're building that. But other than that, that's that's my vision right now. Now, you know it can change. I'll see you in two years and say, I need five FTs, can you help me out? But we're not there yet. Okay, got it. Let me skip down real quick. Thank you. Um, okay, can I go now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, bye. Bye. Mr. Wells, are you still here? There he is. Hello. And I apologize for cutting you off. I know you, uh, you're always here giving us great information and insight and a unique perspective about how we can do better with uh, our, our, our agency, the DPR. I wanted to ask you, though, you talked about um, just the need for additional services at some of our parks. Um, water fountains, restrooms, and especially restrooms. I, 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 I'm in a park a lot or different parks, and I agree with that. Um, and I, I live by a park, and so my family and I go there often. Um, and you, you also spoke about um, the uh, Jefferson Field uh, about, I didn't hear exactly what you said, but you said something will be impeding on the field. What is that something that will be impeding? Yeah, so right after me, a uh, representative from Casey Trees um, jumped on and uh, what ended up happening, I've spoken to the president of Casey Trees, I've talked to the director of DPR, um, and what they did was they planted trees on the athletic field. All right. Now, Jefferson Field is located in Southwest. It is a um, smaller, it's not a regulation football size field, or it's not regulation baseball, but they have both baseball and football on there mm -hmm. for the middle school. And instead of planting the trees outside the fence line, they planted a row of trees inside the fence line. What's going to happen is these roots will come and they'll, they'll be on the playing field. The trees will grow. And if you're throwing a pass or hitting a baseball, the branches will get in the way. So two years ago, immediately after they were planted, I, I asked DPR and Casey Trees who, get, you know, who authorized it. Nobody could identify who authorized planting the trees there. Um, but eventually DPR said, okay, we'll move them. Well, then COVID struck and nothing happened. Uh, and now the trees are growing. They, they started off at 12 to 15 feet. Now they're 20 to 25 feet tall. Um, there was some funding in the budget for uh, turfing over Jefferson Field, which I wholly support, by the way, because it's got lights. It's just really primed for a turf field. Uh, and DPR now says that they'll remove the trees when they start the renovation project. Well, I asked them when they're going to start the renovation project, and they had no idea. Got it. So, All right. okay. Um, I did want to ask you. You talked about the Fun Act. Yes, yes. It's Council Member Pinto's legislation on ha providing council oversight for um, these long-term leases that DPR is entering into with various entities, such as at Jella Field, the one um, that they entered into with Murray. I'm familiar. Um, and then I attached to my testimony is the list of uh, leases that they have. Um, you know, Brentwood Hamilton has an 85 year lease on it over in Ward uh, 5. And then in Ward 8, a 999 yard, uh, year lease at the Ark. I mean, it's ridiculous. These are public assets held in trust by the District of Columbia, and they should not be converted into private hands. And, and that's what that legislation uh, is going to do is provide a level of oversight. It won't, it won't prohibit it, but it provides a little level of oversight. And I'm asking you as the chair of the parks um, uh, committee to, to get behind that legislation if you're not already. And I also heard you talk about the, uh, I guess, multiplex facility. I've been to the one in Virginia. Amazing, wow. <laughs> I know, we need that here. So I did have a conversation with the director, Director Hunter, about that, and he's visited there before as well, and also had a con conversation with Mayor Bowser before as well. I don't know where we are in regards to budgeting and space for that, but it's definitely a conversation that's been had and continues to be talked about, just trying to figure out where we are, because, I mean, I, I, I go to a lot of the sports events in the district, and I just think that we can use something like that to help better prepare our youth and young adults 
uh, to compete uh, all over the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, my, my children are by no means at the Olympic uh, caliber, but they do participate in nine or ten different sports in high school. And there's always field issues. There's always time issues. There's, um, you know, when they were running track, they do their indoor meets out at PG County, which has a wonderful facility too. Uh, and at the time, the football team, the Washington football team, funded that complex uh, as a result of moving to Landover. Um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity if the Washington football team comes back to DC to get some funding there. But I think I think DC should do this on their own. And, or maybe it goes through events DC and not DPR. I don't know. Got you. Uh, uh, looking for Miss Kim from my office with my clock. Are you still here? Because I, I don't. I want to respect Councilmember Christina Henderson's time as well. Um, so I want to be respectful. Uh, while we while she's doing that, let me run down to uh, Alan Ray from Casey Trees. Uh, is Mr. Ray still here? Can you speak to that issue at Jefferson Middle School as it relates to the trees being inside of the fence instead of the outside of the fence and just the long-term effects of that? Just, I, can't, I can see you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. A little better, if you could turn it up a little bit more. I can't, I can't hear you, brother. I can hear something. Go ahead, try again. Is it just low on my end? If my staff can put in the comments, if it's just low on my end because I can't hear him. All right, while you're doing that, I'm gonna have to skip down because we have 26 witnesses today and government witnesses. So I'll come back to you, Mr. Ray. Um, I'm gonna run down to Ms. Coyne. Is Ms. Coyne still here? Okay, I don't see her. Uh, Ms. Ms. Beal. Hi there, yes. Hey, there we go. All right. Um, what has been the responses by residents about your plans um, for the World at Auction Run? What have you been hearing as far as feedback? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we've worked really hard to bring in, you know, we had community visioning sessions for, as you know, probably about two years. So I think folks are really excited. I mean, I, I had a uh, Monica Ray say to me at one point, um, this is the first time a project has come in and nobody's <laughs> nobody's talking smack about it. Um, however, you know, I know that there are some uh, some neighbors directly across the street that have uh, expressed some concerns about uh, additional activity on the street. Um, one gentleman in particular, I think, moved into that house two years ago and so wasn't present for some of those community conversations we had, moved in after the, you know. Uh, you talking about the house or the tall white house? You know, I'm not gonna specify which house the gentleman lives in, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's sort of towards the left. It's closer to where the youth garden area is gonna be. So I know that he's uh, raised some concerns at uh, the ANC meetings and, you know, we've been doing our best to make sure that we're keeping really open conversation, particularly with, um, you know, through the ANC around any any kinds of issues that might come up. Um, you know, certainly we're sorry that um, we weren't aware that there were new folks who had moved into homes. As you know, we, we really work to make sure that everybody was uh, welcomed to give input along the way. So, I mean, that's really the only, um, sets of concerns that we've heard. And, you know, I think it's, 
it's disruptive for anybody when there's construction happening directly across the street. So, yeah. you know, I'm hopeful that that will all settle down once things are open and it's such an asset there. I do know you have done an amazing job doing community engagement. Um, and I, I haven't heard anything. And I, as I think about where you all are, that's about three blocks, three blocks from my house. Um, I just look at that strip. There's not that many people living right there. So it's two different uh, ones, transition home and a, a home for return to citizens. Also Cure the Streets has a- That's right. A, and we've had a great relationship with Cure the yeah. Streets throughout this. Um, Uncle Charles has come out to some of our events. I mean, there's, you know, we, we've got, and I think we're so lucky, you know, at, I would just say very blessed to have, uh, you know, Jaron here leading the project because what we've always wanted to be very clear about as an organization is that, you know, DC Greens is here to do resource transfer so that the community can develop this space on its own terms, you know, with its own vision of wellness. And so, you know, having Jaron leading the charge on that, um, Kenneth Bridgers as our farmer, you know, we're partnering with the Green Scheme. We've got a beautiful relationship with Ab Jordan and Brenda Richardson. So I feel very positive about how this is going to continue to develop as a real, um, a true asset where, you know, the uh, community organizations that have been doing amazing work on the ground for so long are also really able to benefit from the, the resources that will come in for their organizations to continue to do their good work. So um, we're excited. Yep, I'm excited myself. So I wanna thank you, I have to digress and turn over to Council member Christina Henderson, she has any questions or comments. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions for this panel. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. And I see the comment from uh, Mr. Shackleford about other locations such as Deanwood uh, with trees covering a goalpost area. Um, so I ping my staff on that so we can come check that out. All right, moving on to the next panel. Um, Thank you. You can bring them in. All right. So we have James Harris, Maya Stuckey, Sabrina Rhodes, Brenda Ingram Best, Robert Oliver. And I see some people chance want us to speed through the witness list. We want to give everyone, everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, if you can start off, Mr. Harris, we're ready for you. Hey, how you doing? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. Councilman White, appreciate the time. Uh, so I'm um, a part of the uh, DC DPR boxing program. So we're housed out of uh, Bald Eagle. Um, right now, uh, we all of the boxing programs in uh, the city they're under one umbrella where we have a uh, Ball Eagle, Woody Ward, Kenilworth, Langdon, Emory Heights. Then we're opening another gym in Columbia Heights. Um, uh, we have probably over 150 participants in each, uh, you know, throughout the whole city. What we're doing now is everybody's one entity. So instead of it being a whole bunch of different teams, we're one DPR boxing program in our city and representing the city throughout the United States. Uh, all our programs are, uh, all of our programs are recognized through uh, USA Boxing and um, certified and licensed through USA. Uh, we participate in every tournament in the world. So we've the Eastern Invitational, the Western Olympic Trials, and then we had one of our DC uh, boxers. Uh, he's been in DPR his whole life. He just won the gold medal in the Pan Am Games, so he represented uh, DC in that in that manner. Um, we, uh, like I said, when we travel, we, we ask for things for, um, uh, you know, transportation, room and board, uh, you know, all of the kids always end up in the top three whenever we uh, participate in any of these tournaments. Uh, also we want to bring things back home. So we want to have showcases that highlight our boxers in the DMV and mainly the kids in the DPR program, but we still got other kids who, who really want to box and be a part of the program, but they don't know or have the funding or anything like that to get into the programs. Uh, we work really, really cl 
close with a uh, DC Boston Commission and other come in, but uh, like say our main focus is uh, you know, what we got going in DPR. Um, and then like I say with the local fights in the showcase, we wanna, yeah, we've had the Mayor's Cup, we brought that back up. The Mayor's Cup used to be a really, really big thing in DC where it took place at uh, Howard University. And uh, every city in the area, you know, as far as New York, uh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, they came to the city and they represented their city. So we want to get back to that so we can, you know, make it a city versus city, you know, and then with us being the nation's capital, really, it, you know, put us on the pedestal in order to get these things done. Um, and like I say, our main focus with the boxing programs, like you say, through all of the DPR programs, uh, we use it as a tool to promote the discipline, you know, structure and positive, you know, like say in, in this day and time, you know, we, we really need, you know, positive things going on with the kids with all of the craziness going on. And we, we don't turn down any kids, you know, you know, we, we deal with a bullying program. We got some kids get bullied, self-esteem, you know, and we also do competition boxing. So through that, you know, we like say with the show, we want to expose it to the whole district of Columbia so they can understand why, what we do for the youth in DC. Got it. Thank you so much. I'll come back in a few. Um, All right, Stucky? Hi, can, can, is my camera on right now? It, no, it's not. Uh, uh, can I, I can do it with my camera off, right? Sure. Okay, sorry. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Okay. Um, I would first like to start off by introducing myself. Um, hi, my name is Maya Stuckey. Uh, I'm a 16 year old from Ivy City and a current sophomore at Murray. Um, and as you may know, we won our long battle with getting the residents of Ivy City uh, and the residents of the neighborhood a safe place to play. And over the course of the past year, we have seen so much development to the historic Carmel site. With the lot still being in its early development stages and the many conversations to be held regarding the development, I believe that it is crucial that the residents of Ivy City be involved with these conversations. The members of my community are very active regarding development in our area, and I feel as though excluding us from those from receiving uh, information is very hurtful to our relationships with Department of Parks and Recs, uh, more council members, and so many more important partners that's that are turning Cromel into a space that is something truly meant for residents. Ivy City has often been overlooked in the district and without an active face on the council um, that wants to keep Ivy, not, without an active face on the council that wants to keep not only Ivy City, but Cromel on the map, I would like to ask you, Council Member White, to make sure that Ivy City gets the recognition that it deserves. I'm also looking for your support in a library kiosk for the Cromel site. The Camel building is still years away from development and the current climate prevents easy access and safe temperatures for the books to be accessed. Um, we think that it would be best for the kiosk to be temporarily held at the clubhouse until the Carmel site is open to see um, how many children of the neighborhood, seeing how so many children of the neighborhood fre frequent the clubhouse and how Commissioner Rhodes is actively located there. Um, the Carmel site is only at the beginning of something truly great, and I look forward with connecting with you, Councilmember White, to focus on keeping Carmel a safe place to play. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate that so much. Um, and we'll hear from Sabrina Rhodes. Hi, good afternoon, Councilmember White and members of the committee. My name is Sabrina Rhodes. I'm the ANC commissioner here in Ivy City and an organizer with Empower DC. And I'm here on behalf of Ivy City. We are thankful for your support in the campaign to fix Cromel. Since the last time I testified, we were working to get the interim play space on the Cromel school site, as uh, Maya mentioned. We have been able to, to enjoy two full-size basketball courts in the playground. Also, as you know, Mayor Bowser put 20 million in the budget for the renovation of the school. What we're focused on now is the implementation of the plans Tommy Jones and the DPR team are working on. Meaningful community engagement is key. So we have a couple of planning, we had a couple of planning meetings to let us know where they are in the process and the timeline. 
We did request to see the proposals and to have this be part of the planning process, but we were told it couldn't be shared. And are there any proposals for the contractor and the architect yet for uh, the renovation of Cremento? This summer, DPR um, brought in the Boys and Girls Club to do a camp on a Cremel site. Although we were excited that the children um, had a camp, we were disappointed that the planning wasn't done properly. Ivy City has an urban heat island effect, which means our temperatures can be anywhere between 10 and 20 degrees hotter than the actual temperature. The communication was spotty. There was no canopy, canopy put on the playground during the construction and was told it wasn't in the budget. So no shade over there, no water. There was a hand washing station brought in with the Porta Johns for the staff and the children to use. And there was no electricity and no fridge. Although we, want to, we wanted to get started with programming and excited to have something available for the community, we need for the planning to be more organized and thought out. The children that attended had fun, especially playing in a safe space just for them. The Boys and Curls Club made it work and what they had with what they had. I joined in a few times, but the heat was just too much. <laughs> Nevertheless, we had fun. We are aware that 20 million is for the renovation of the school during our last meeting with DPR. We found out that we plan, we have to plan for the entire two acres on the grounds as well. At some point, we would need more funds in the budget for outdoor amenities and want to ask you, Council Member White to continue to support us once we ask for more money. And also, um, we're, uh, Lewis Crow Park is supposed to be in, in, we thought that Lewis Crow Park was in DPR's portfolio, but if you can give us clarity on that, um, that would be greatly appreciated. What park was that? Lewis Crow Park on okay. West Virginia and Mount Olivet. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Now we hear from Ms. Brenda Ingram Best. Oh, there she go. <laughs> Good afternoon, Treyong White, and everyone here at the hearing. My name is Brenda Ingram. Best. I'm a longtime resident of Ivy City. I'm a member of Empower DC and Friends of Cormel. I want to thank you for supporting us and helping with the interim recreation. My son grew up here in Ivy City and never had a safe place to play. So I'm very excited about finally having a multi generational community center where my grandkids and great grandkids can go to which they will be opening in 2024. It was great being able to walk on the Cromwell site with the soft opening that we had last spring. This school, the, Crum the Alexandria Cromwell School that I went to has been closed since 1977. Cromwell was the heart of Ivy City and we are thankful to be getting it back. So we would love DPR to continue engaging with me and my community, keeping planning, including our thoughts and ideas, keeping us updated in progress changes and the budget. We also want to help, we also want to help direct what kind of programs we are having for my grandkids and great grandkids and the children in our community. I frequently meet with the alumni of Cromel and Ivy City. <laughs> And we enjoy the events in POW DC sponsored. We also invite you to come to do a walkthrough so that you can see how much space we have to plan for and would like you to 
um, your continued support. Thanks for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much. Um, and I would love to come and do a walkthrough with you guys. If one of you all can leave your email uh, in the chat, my staff and email and number, if you don't want to leave your number in there, I understand, but you can email me your information so we can follow up and get that scheduled. See the thumbs up. <laughs> All right, make sure I'm not forgetting anybody. Robert Oliver. It's still muted. Okay, cool. Um, yes, my name is, uh, well, first thing, good afternoon, Council Member White Sr. and uh, Council Member Henderson. It's an honor to speak with you about these issues. And uh, I just want to give you a little background. My name is Robert Oliver. I'm the treasurer of the Friends of the Rick LaSalle Recreation Center. And as treasurer, I'd like to take a brief look at you know our budgets and the budgets of the city just to get some idea of what's going on. In a nutshell, the fiscal year 22 approved operating budget is for DC government uh, for the recreation center is a 71.7 million, which is an increase of 17.8% over the fiscal year 21 budget of 60.9 million. Much of the increase was from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA, which contributed a one-time funding increase of about 6 million. This increase in funding represents an opportunity for DPR to address deferred maintenance at the Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center. The Friends of the Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center requests 3 million to address past deferred maintenance and future enhancements at the Riggs LaSalle Rec. With the uncertainty of future budget growth due to COVID-19, I will discuss only the deferred maintenance uh, needs while my colleagues will discuss other issues. Our maintenance issues include outdoors, a new field that replaces the current eco-friendly turf. Evidently, uh, yeah, the field is uh, becoming um, hurtful and dangerous, and we'd like something that is more akin to when people fall down, they don't uh, uh, wind up with a lot of uh, bruises or what have you. Uh, secondly, we'd like to reconfigure the outdoor concession stand to service those uh, on the field. Right now, the way it's built, is that they assume that everyone would buy on the outside, they go on the field and eat. But what happens is if people want to buy again, there's no way to access the concession stand from the field. You have to go back outside, outside the fence, buy and come back in, which you know doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's the way it's, it's built. <coughs> we would like to have the outdoor splash pool redone. And we like to enhance the security of our outdoor restrooms. We're one of the few fields that actually have outdoor restrooms. We actually have a camera that faces it. But at night, uh, whether it's the kids or the homeless, uh, people uh, break in it and do all kinds of things. All we ask is that a better door somehow um, beyond or an enhancement of what we currently have to keep the, um, that facility from being damaged and keep people from doing uh, things in there they shouldn't be doing. In terms of the recreation center, um, we would like to replace the HVAC. It had been broken for several years, and part of the problem was um, they were looking for a very specific part, and what it had to do with uh, <clears throat> the part being unusual, old, or um, caught up in the uh, issues uh, of today where things are taking a long time to come in, it took them a while to get that part in place. Uh, hopefully we can get a new system where parts are more available. We'd also like to replace or repair the gym roof. It's been leaking periodically since uh, 2018. Uh, we'd like to uh, get something done on that if possible. Uh, also, we'd like to replace the uh, waterless urinals in the men's restroom with flushable models. And the reason being waterless is a great idea in theory but uh, it's hard to keep the stench down. So the flushable models uh, are preferred. Uh, lastly, we have an indoor stove 
which is the door is broken and is relatively old. A ticket has been sent, but we would like to make sure that this uh, ha issue has been expedited. Um, these are the above long and standing issues that have been reported and that our community still endures. We ask for funds to fix these items so the recreation center can return to being an inviting, family friendly, and fully functional facility. And I'd like to uh, thank you and your staff and uh, Councilman Henderson for uh, your time in providing attention to our issues. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump back up. Miss, let me go to Miss Miss Stucky real quick. Is she here, the young lady? I'm here. Okay. Uh, one of the things I heard you talk about with the, was the lack of communication um, from DPR with the community. Uh, I, I have been made aware of some zooms that they had in reference to the community. Uh, are you saying that they're not doing a great job of, of getting the information out? Oh, I can see you now. Yeah. Uh, community, uh, what's the what? What do you find as a breakdown in communication with the residents or the community? Um, I feel like a lot of the time I have to go through Commissioner Rhodes to get information, and Commissioner Rhodes is like jumping through hoops and hurdles to get that information herself. And it just really feels like I mean, we've had past experience was like in the um in the work of trying to get the community center. We have had, we've had past experiences of just like having the like pull and tug for this information that should be available to the residents. And uh, there's been like a small pattern of that repeating, like with me having to ask stuff through Commissioner Rhodes. And I just don't feel like that's the most effective way of communicating because it just limits us from like pushing, uh, from getting through like the development faster. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that the head of, the heads of DPR are watching. So please make sure you put your uh, email, if you have one in the chat, and we'll be asking them some of these questions as well. You spoke in your testimony uh, about the clubhouse. What is the clubhouse and where is it located? Uh, I don't know the address. I think Commissioner Rhodes knows the address, but the clubhouse is basically, uh, it's um, one of these houses, well, Commissioner Rhodes is at the clubhouse. It's like, it's a. it's basically like, a smaller community center for the kids. Um, last year, uh, I used to go there and do my homework, but if I wanted to, I could like walk around there and I can get a snack after school, or I could go play on the basketball court for the uh, the neighbor who lives next to the clubhouse. He built the basketball court. So I could also go play over there, but it was just a place where if I didn't want to be at home or I found that I needed somewhere else safe to play, I could go there and like, I, I would know that I'm being taken care of. Thank you, and Ms. Commissioner, can you cut your microphone on? Who runs yes. this? Who runs this particular clubhouse? I'm I'm the coordinator of the clubhouse, but uh, the basketball court in the in the back, Ryan Linehan, was the former commissioner, and the basketball court is in his back in the back of his house. So oh. we are right where, yeah, this is where um, Ryan Linehan lives and this is his house. And we uh, made it into the clubhouse for the community so that the children don't, play, don't have to play in the street. We have a driveway, we, all, we have meals for whoever needs them. We have snack bags for the children. We have computers that Ryan has donated for the children to be able to do their homework. So this is like a, a resource slash after school slash um, mm. central location where the children can come and feel safe until Cornell is open. And I guess the, so the, yeah. I guess the theme I'm hearing is about consistent uh, and transparent community engagement. And I heard, yes. uh, you know, 
we talked about the twenty million dollars slated for renovation, but I yeah. hear saying something about an interim space to do programming now. Um, is that space adequate to do programming? What's the I mean, what's the size of that space? And can you speak to that? It's about uh, it's a two story house, okay. and it's pretty it's pretty large. Um, we have classrooms upstairs. So what we wanted to do, which I was going to testify at your library here, and I've been asking for a kiosk, a library kiosk to have here at the at the at the clubhouse until they open up Cremel, and then we can transfer that program and over to Cremel. Got it. So it's just um, the interim. It's just a. a you know, temporary space. We hope to keep it for the community once Cremel opens, but it's a familiar space. Um, I take care of the children when they come in and they know they're safe. Yeah. Now that we have the basketball courts, we have the basketball courts at Cremel and we have the playground at Cremel. So they can go over there and play, but a lot of times, this is a more familiar, so they come here if they, you know, want to play ball out back or do homework. Can you share the sentiments or where the community feel, or where are they in regards to the potential Cromel location, where they are with it, beyond the communication, just like the structure of it, how it's going to be done, uh, is, uh, is, is DPR taking the feedback and applying it, that type of engagement? Well, we, the meetings that we've had with um, Tommy Jones was that they're uh, right now in the spring, because first we're getting the 5 million, uh, we got it last October. So that's supposed to cover the, uh, the contractors and the architects. We're not sure if any have been found yet. Um, I, I can contact Tommy Jones, but as far as getting that information, I don't have, and we, we need to plan a meeting sometime soon a community meeting with DPR to find out where they are with the plans, with the contractors and with the architects. That information we haven't gotten yet, but um, as I stated in my testimony and Ms. Brenda and Maya, we wanna be part of every bit of the planning from beginning to the end. And we wanna be part of the planning, the process. We wanna know who the contractors are. We wanna help plan for mail. And um, Tommy Jones uh, is well aware <laughs> how we feel about uh, being part of that process. We got it. Thank you. And we'll, we'll follow up with them as well. I wanna thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to speak, shoot down to Mr. Oliver. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so I, I heard the sentiments of where you and the community are in regards to Riggs LaSalle. Has any of these requests been communicated with the director and or the mayor um, as it relates to uh, some, of these, some of these things is egregious? Roof leaking, HVAC, doors, I mean. Well, let me say this. Uh, my testimony, uh, there's a lot of good that's been done at uh, Riggs LaSalle. My testimony concentrated on some of the long-term issues. Uh, yes, the roof leaks, but it's periodic. Um, it uh, happens uh, after a hard rains and not at every rain. Uh, it has been reported. Guys have gone and looked at it but they seemingly can't find all the leaks. So what we're saying is that if that's the case, and it's been happening periodically since 2008, then maybe it's time to uh, quit thinking about bandages and just uh, work on the entire roof. It's still up to them to decide the best fix. We're just saying that the fixes that have been applied so far have not addressed the entire problem. Thing. And I appreciate you sharing that, but I also think that, you know, uh, with us having a $17.5 billion budget, a AAA bond rating, uh, we've grown from $14.5 billion to $17.5 since I've been in office. 
And so it's a matter of priority and hearing from residents about what those needs are, because, you know, you can't expect anyone to have a maximized capacity of the roof leaking over, you know, you can't get the basic amenities inside a facility because that caused other problems as well. Um, so we're concerned about that. Um, we will be jotting down. I'll be doing a visit there within the next uh, two weeks as a visit facility as well. Have you have they spoke to you about any of the estimated costs to get those repairs done? Uh, not to me directly uh, as a uh, nonprofit. Uh, there is a limit to what, you know, sometimes is shared. But I have other colleagues on, including Tisha Cockrell, who is the actual president, and she may have more privy to that information than I. Okay. We'll check back with them. But I want to thank you for your testimony. We're going to move to the witness list so we can get to the government witnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you got James Rose. All right, our next we have Alexander Pedro, Brenda Richardson, Tisha Cockrell, Colleen Crino, Mr. Pedro, you're here. You might as well go ahead and get started and we go to the next one. This is following you. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, committee members and council staff. I'm Alexander Padro, president of the board of directors of the Friends of Kennedy Playground Incorporated and a former 10 term advisory neighborhood commissioner representing the Shaw neighborhood. The Kennedy Recreation Center, now in Ward 2 after a decade of Ward 6, has consistently drawn some of the highest daily usage of any facility in DPR's portfolio for many years. The Friends fundraise and provide financial and volunteer support for activities at the center and advocate on behalf of the facility, seeking improvements in the physical plan, grounds, and program. There are five issues we would like to bring to your attention today. The Friends of Kennedy Playground incorporated and became a 501c3 nonprofit organization in 1996. We advocated for the construction of the current recreation center building and play DC enhancements, among other efforts. We have funded basketball tournaments, art classes, tickets for offsite events for seniors and youth, annual award ceremonies, holiday banquets, and much more. The Friends submitted a proposal to become an official DPR Park partner on July 8, 2021. To date, we have had no response to our proposal, despite several attempts by our vice president, Tony Brown, to reach out to the appropriate program manager. It's frustrating to follow DPR's procedures so that we can be in full compliance with relevant DC government policies and procedures, only to have those efforts not be acknowledged for over six months. Kennedy has never reopened after closure at the beginning of the COVID-19 public health emergency. To date, the building has not reopened to the public. We were told that the reason for this was because construction on a planned renovation was to take place before the center would reopen. However, two years later, construction has not yet started. The Roving Leaders Program moved their headquarters to the building shortly after the building closed, however. When a citywide national night event was scheduled for Kennedy's Field in August 2021, DPR initially refused to even allow the bathrooms accessible from the field to be available for the event. This decision was reversed when Councilmember Allen interceded. Other than on that occasion, the building has been opened for Halloween, special events, and vaccination events, but has not otherwise been open to the public. Why is the building still closed and our community deprived of its use when the proposed construction has not started or even been designed and permitted? The current Kennedy Recreation Center building opened in 2003. The Friends have advocated for a variety of improvements and repairs, including the removal of a wall to expand the size of the center's senior room. One million dollars in capital funding was budgeted for renovations to the building in FY21. Construction was ostensibly postponed by the COVID-19 public health emergency. Councilmember Allen's staff has been trying for the past year to get answers to why the center remains closed, what the renovation plans consist of, what the construction schedule is, and what alternative arrangements could be made to serve the community during the construction closure. In December 2021, DPR told Councilmember Allen's staff that the scope of work for the project had only just been completed that month. At that time, there were no architectural plans, much less a contract for the construction. In the meantime, our children, adults, and seniors are being deprived of the ability to use the facility with no date set for construction to begin or for the center's return to full operation. 
The Friends have been trying to get DPR to attend a meeting of the Friends Board to make a presentation and answer questions about the proposed renovations to the center. What provisions have we made to offer programming and services to our community during the closure and a schedule for the construction? We made this request through Council Member Allen's office several times. Despite most recently offering dates in November, December 2021 and January 2022, DPR has refused to meet with the Friends or provide any information to our community about the issues described. We are now waiting to see if Council Member Pinto's staff has any better luck in getting DPR to meet with us and explain how they propose to proceed. Any assistance you can provide, Mr. Chairman, in getting DPR to be responsive to the Shaw community and our friends group would be most welcome. Lastly, Shaw and adjacent neighborhoods do not have an easily accessible senior center. It may have services to be aging closed at senior center in the neighborhood years ago. The nearest senior centers are miles away at Emory and Virginia Hayes Williams. While in the past, DPR provided dedicated senior programming staff at Kennedy, those positions were eliminated before the center closed for the COVID emergency. Gone are the exercise in our classes, field trips and other activities that our seniors rely on to avoid be, being isolated at home. Funding for the restoration of senior programming at Kennedy is urgently needed and hopefully can be included in the agency's FY23 budget. Thank you for listening to our concerns. I'm available to answer any questions you may have now or after this hearing. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Who else we have here? Brenda Richardson, is Ms. Brenda here? Hey, Ms. Brenda. Hi, Ms. Hey, how are you, Mr. Chair? Really? Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify before you and the other distinguished members of your committee. My name is Brenda Richardson. I'm a resident of Ward 8 and here to testify at this oversight hearing for DPR. I am a member of the Friends of Oxen Run Park and the facilitator for the Police Service Area 702 Outreach Committee in the 7th Police District. Our beloved children in PSA 702 have no real form of recreation. Before COVID, we partnered with DPR to do three pop-up recreation activities in June, July, and August. The Rec Mobile Unit provides our little ones with an opportunity to ride bikes in a safe place that is provided by property owners or churches. The DPR has also done pop-up roller skating and movie night. These two hours of recreation for our Rec deprived children goes a long way while they are in the throes of the pandemic and continuously exposed to collective trauma. DPR has been a wonderful champion in their response to the pandemic by providing valued safe venues for pop-up outdoor program programming for youth in our PSA continuously. Um, the Friends of Ox and Run, before I share about the Friends of Ox and Run, just wanted to give kudos to Lauren and Jaron for the great jobs that they're doing over at the well in Ox and Run Park. The Friends of Ox and Run Park provides outdoor learning to Ward 8 youth every month at the James E. Bunn Amphitheater in Ox and Run Park. I also wanted to share that DPR's permitting process is exceptionally clear about adhering to COVID restrictions on their property. Thanks to DPR, we were able to provide a bit of respite for parents and their children, such as trauma breaks, bird watching, art in the park, music and math, and our biggest attraction was story time with MPD. DPR gets an A plus because they made parks available when we needed them the most. In closing, it is my hope that you can see fit to shower this agency with much favor in the form of more funding for staff, vehicles, equipment, and yes, we need restrooms. I hope the next time I come and testify, we will have a restroom in Oxen Run Park and programming when that time rolls around. Delano Hunter was the mayor's absolutely best choice for his position as director of the agency. He and his wonderful staff, Watani, Xavier, Nick, Katie, understand that you can't take a cookie cutter approach to providing recreation in disfavored communities because they are all very different. He has a great staff that does a superb job at activating our parks with meaningful recreation. Director Hunter has an impeccable reputation and he deserves more funding to do an even greater work for the District of Columbia. Thank you much for your time. Thank you. Our next witness is 
Tishka Cockrell. Tisha. I see you here on the screen. There we go. And then I can't hear you. Go right ahead. You're still muted. Okay, I just got the unmute. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Great. All righty. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Council Member White and uh, other council members on the uh, committee here. And um, my name is Tisha Cockrell and I'm the president of the Friends of Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center. Um, as you heard, we are partnered with DC Department of Parks and Recs and we're together working with the site director, Ms. Sherlita Settles and the staff at our community recreation center. We are here today to make a plea to receive funds to assist with site maintenance and new item requests. So you heard from the treasurer already, Mr. Robert Oliver, who spoke about the funds and our community would love to see our Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center uh, get its fair share of those funds. I have personally witnessed Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center staff using their own personal funds to help patrons of the center and assist the center in various endeavors. We are asking for approximately my written um, testimony says 1.5 million, but due to some research we did yesterday, uh, we'd be more uh, apt to ask for 3 million um, to help us renew, repair, and restore our community center. So the following is a list of recreation center requests raised by our community. The outdoor recreation center issues are, you heard about the eco-friendly turf field that replaces the current field, which has been deemed unsafe. Our outdoor fitness equipment on grassy area, we would like some outdoor fitness equipment, uh, an oval track around the football field if the space permits. We'd like to reconfigure the outdoor concession stand as you heard from our treasurer to service those on the field and remove the stove. Currently the concession stand faces the sidewalk in the street and not the field. We'd like to enhance security of the outdoor restrooms. Again, our treasurer spoke of that. The replace and replace the doors in the bathroom that do not lock. Uh, we'd like to redo our splash park in the parking area to include lighting. Uh, consider new playground requests from the community. Bring back the outdoor fenced-in garden between the school and the playground. Indoor center uh, issues are replace the entrance doors. They never seem to close properly. Um, replace the uh, doors to the gym, their uh, old doors as well. Install new window shades instead of aluminum blinds. Repaint uh, the building interior, it's old paint. It hasn't been painted in quite some time. Add a mural to the lobby, replace the kitchen stove. A ticket has been sent for that. Replace waterless urinals in the men's restroom with flushable models. The waterless ones are pr uh, providing a problem. Uh, we'd like to increase Wi-Fi bandwidth capacity building wide. Uh, we have a problem with Wi-Fi quite a bit. Repair, repair and replace windows in the multi-purpose room. Repair, replace the gym roof. You heard about that roof. So it's been periodically leaking since 2008, which is when the wreck was built. We'd like to replace the HVAC system with a new system. You heard the story of the parts that are always, um, excuse me, having uh, to be replaced hire a full-time security guard, which has actually happened by the way, we thank you for that. We like to keep that going. Um, we uh, like to purchase a multi-purpose project projector and drop down screen for the multi-purpose room, a uh, new ping pong table, an allotment for the community, uh, children for summer camp and little explorers for ages three to five years old. Um, also, we'd like to give you a list of our current programs and activities. So we have 20 in-school internships from Riggs Park for, for Riggs Park teens, the highest participation in the city. Our teens are paid for six hours a week. Uh, we have seven youth basketball teams participating this winter. We have a great yoga class program on Saturday mornings. We are glad to have our piano classes back again. We uh, have a, our, our center won the two citywide tournaments during the pandemic, which was a kickball tournament and a Madden 22 tournament. Our young ladies on the rise had a very successful clothing drive and will give a cultural experience presentation. Our seniors participated in the mayor's holiday party. Our seniors and youth participated in an intergenerational um, 
um, forum. Our uh, seniors enjoyed going to the Kennedy Center. They saw Ain't Too Proud to Beg. They were excited by that stage play. We had a great youth holiday party. We currently have one of the largest hand dancing classes in the city. We hosted and participated Council Member Lewis George's turkey giveaway. We held a wonderful tea party with our Lamon Rig Citizens Association seniors and Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George. Mrs. Settles, the site director, and Sherilyn Mack and Andre Lee have continued to serve our senior residents with meals in our neighborhood. Rig LaSalle continues to be a continues to be a pickup site for COVID-19, test yourself kits, and we had a successful opioid Narcan training summit. Now, the above highlights our center's good works. We also want to be sure that there's attention to in our detailed list we've provided here. Regarding why we need or to receive the funds and to enhance our, enhance our further projects, we have been suggest, subjected to deferred maintenance and neglected for a number of years at this rec. We are asking to get the funds we need to bring our community recreation center to the 21st century. Um, so can you uh, give final remarks, please? I'm sorry. Okay, so that was the final remark. We're just trying to get to the 21st century. Other recreation centers have these amenities and we'd like to have them as well. And we uh, appreciate your attention and concerning this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Colleen Crino. Hi, good afternoon, uh, council member and committee members. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. Um, as you can see, my name is Colleen Crino and I represent the Hardy Middle School PTO as our civic liaison. Um, I also have students at both Hardy in Ward 2 and at Key Elementary in Ward 3. And actually a few of the prior individuals testifying have touched on some topics that I wanted to cover. So I'm gonna to touch on some additional topics too related to field usage and needs that are specific to Hardy students and also to a few other fields in wards two and three that serve our DCPS students and residents. So the Hardy Middle School community is very excited as Mary Coyne touched on about the proposed project to renovate the Jellif Recreation Center and make it a modern facility. Um, currently there are over 100 DCPS students who are in aftercare at Jellif and while they'll benefit from these upcoming renovations, we're also concerned with an extended construction and renovation timeline um, so we don't want these children to be displaced from their aftercare facility. Um, so we'd also, we'd also like to request that Hardy be included as a stakeholder in the planning process for this space. Um, additionally, Hardy Middle School has experienced a dramatic 60% growth rate in students in the past three years. And we're now at the number of students that were in the city's five-year projection for school year 27 to 28. Um, and we have 25 sports, 30% of our student body participates as student athletes. So that's presented both current and longer term needs for the growing community. And with that, we're in need of a significant field and facilities improvement and expansion to support the continued growth of the student population. Um, because even with those Jellif improvements that we're excited about and increased usage by Hardy, Hardy's own facilities are inadequate they're worn out, they're dangerous for the use of its students today, and certainly will not support future student growth, which we know will happen. So now is the time to begin the planning. The physical plant of the building needs to be modified and reconstructed to include underground parking, expansion of classroom, excuse me, and athletic space encompassing existing turf fields that could be upgraded and reimagined to include athletic fields, courts, possibly a swimming pool, this will give an opportunity for participation in these facilities by community members through DPR as well. Um, I wanna thank very much um, the De Deputy Mayor of Education, uh, Kine and the DPR team for listening to the school communities of Hardy, Duke Ellington and School Without Walls regarding their need for consistent at, um, access to athletic fields and continuing to place priority on the use um, by these three schools for weekday afternoons on that Duke Ellington field. Um, and evenings during the school year. We'd like to just continue to ask for your support, uh, not to allow any private contracts for school nights or uh, which are weeknights during the school year. I also wanna thank the DPR team for its great work on the renovation of the Hardy Rec Center on Foxhall Road, which is now being actively used by the community. I would like to request that DPR, DCPS and the council 
continue to engage the community as discussions proceed for the MacArthur and Foxhall school plans, particularly as any of those plans pertain to removing or impacting the rec center assets, particularly the field. And on that note, I would also like to request to DPR and DCPS to consider opening for use the currently vacant Georgetown Day School field, which the city purchased to create the MacArthur School. So that's a turf field with a parking lot that could be used by students and the community members while the planning process is still underway for the new school. It's just chained up and um, not being used by anybody, but it could be um, while, while the planning is underway. And lastly, as, um, as Mr. Wells touched on, I'd like to request to Council Member White and, and the team here to please hold a hearing on the bill proposed by Council Member Pinto, which requires council approval on all long-term leases for the city's public fields really as soon as possible. Um, these public fields, as you're hearing, are crucial resources to our communities, but particularly to the DC public schools, many of which do not have the luxury of having proprietary field space for their student athletes. This bill would protect our public fields from exclusive contract by private entities and ensure that the council can provide oversight to scenarios that would remove the rights of our public school students. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone who spoke today uh, regarding their different uh, opinions and uh, insights to how we can do better. Uh, due to time constraints, I'm going to defer to see if my colleague Christina Henderson has any questions because we have to move on. I see that we have four council members waiting for the government witnesses. Um, council member White, I don't have any uh, questions. I do, I do want to acknowledge I have been listening to everyone's testimony thus far and we'll follow up on the questions in particular around some of the, the rec center concerns um, and playground and ox and run concerns and Cromwell School. I've heard you, so uh, we'll definitely follow up uh, with the director once we get to that testimony. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we have Barbara Robert Rogers, John Holmes, Marcia Lee, Charlene Hers Hersey, Rachel Harvey. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hello, um, Council Member Trayon Tra White, um, uh, Council Member Henderson. My name is Barbara Rogers. I am the president of the Lamont Riggs Citizens Association. The Lamont Riggs Citizens Association has served our residents, schools, recreation centers, and businesses for 74 years. The boundaries of LRCA includes Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center, which you all have heard a lot about, and it also includes the Lamond Recreation Center. LRCA has partnered and supported these recreation centers over the years. To continue our support, we are here to ask for necessary funds to help with the maintenance and improvements for both centers. Um, we also support our friends of Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center, and you have heard from President Tisha Cockrell as well as the treasurer, Mr. Robert Oliver. Ms. Cockrell and I have served this community for many years. We've had several discussions with all levels of the staff at Riggs LaSalle, as well as the Lamont Recreation Center. I also had a discussion with um, recently with the new manager at the Lamont Recreation Center to address their concerns and wishes. We have also heard from the community on some of the overdue improvements that was um, just mentioned by Ms. Cockrell. I do want to acknowledge that Ms. Cockrell provided an estimate of the cost of replacing the field at Riggs LaSalle, but we know how expensive it is to replace these football fields. Therefore, we are suggesting that we increase um, and be more in line um, to ask for 
uh, $3 million for the much needed improvements. Since Ms. Conqueror did a great job of providing a detailed list of Riggs LaSalle uh, recreation needs, for time's sake, I will just discuss the request from the Lamond Recreation Center. The Lamont Recreation Center would like to um, have playground updates, office furniture to include chairs and desks, sewing machines for the adult and youth programs, updated computers, TV wall mounts um, to be able to display um, um, news, sports, and games. Um, that is at a lot of the different recs. So that is all I have in closing. We respectfully request your consideration for the above list of improvements that were discussed by Ms. Cockrell at Ridge LaSalle and the ones just previously mentioned for Lamont Recreation Center. We strongly urge funding to make these centers serve our rapidly expanding and diverse community even more as these centers are long overdue for improvements. And I do want to acknowledge the awesome staff that we have at both of these recreation centers. As I said before, we have a great working relationship with them and we want to continue to support them. Thank you so much for your attention and consideration in my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um... We have Mr. John Holmes. Good afternoon, Council Member Wharton. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you everybody for being here today. My name is John Holmes. I'm the Rita Wright Site Director for the Latin American Youth Center. Uh, I'm here really just to talk about the importance of having a safe space for after school activities and recreational programs. Uh, Rita Bright is formerly known as the number 10 Boys and Girls Club in Columbia Heights, has a rich history of community impact and youth involvement here at Ward 1. Through our partnership with DPR, we're able to continue that impact with similar services and connections with a combination of academics and athletics. We truly believe that these safe spaces are a key to making youth have better decisions and avoid negative behaviors. We like to begin with just this baseline of getting you through the door, of giving you the safe space. And after that, we'd like to build upon it by giving you opportunities to grow academically, socially, and emotionally. With DPR, we are able to do this year round with services that we cannot usually offer, but we are able to go through after programs, seasonal camps, and athletics. It is essential to have the space that we have to engage the youth in activities such as cooking, gardening, art, music, STEM, dance, hip hop, music and just anything that can cultivate their skills and show new talents and interests and more importantly gain life skills whether it's something they're interested in or not it could be something they can use in the future in addition to just the traditional classroom settings and offerings dpr allows us to extend our officer offerings with the athletics we provide three basketball teams and three football teams that are able to participate in a competitive dpr league this allows us to extend our community further with community coaches, volunteer moms and dads, cheerleaders, and just community support of you belong here and you belong with this team. Without the DPR services and communications, we wouldn't be able to do that as just a regular after school program. So our next steps, we are here in uh, Ward 1 and our formerly our partner lot here got turned into the Ward 1 short-term family housing, the Terrell building. We helped uh, DC government kind of partner with that and we were all for it and we are happy to have the families here now. We are beginning to serve the families next door. It's very, very, it's important to have a place next door when you have a short-term family housing spot that's gonna be serving kids that are coming back and forth. It's important to get them an extra support and have a place to go that is right next door. So we're happy to go and serve them. With that said, we are missing our parking lot, but we know that it's gonna be a step further to the future. We've been able to have DPR leadership come by and take a look at our building and see some of the needs that we have now that we have helped out with the building next door. So we're looking forward to making sure that our kids in their safe space can feel like they're not lesser in their own neighborhood. So we have already started some conversations with DPR leadership on how we can improve this building with some of the building leaks and different things like that. Because it's important that when they get here, they do feel like it is safe and they are proud to be here. So we thank DPR for supporting us in that and we wanna continue to our partnerships 
just supporting the youth because they are the future. It's not just a cliche. We need to support them with so much violence and different things going on. We got to give them more positive options. And that's all I have to say. And I just thank everybody for their time. Thank you. Now we will hear from Marcia Lee. Thank you, Councilman. You don't want to get my name right. You get 10 plus, you get 10 plus today. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm probably one of the only few people that really want to give DPR a shout out because DPR saved my life. I was almost 100 pounds heavier thanks to diet and exercise and phenomenal programming that um, low and no cost programming that DPR provides for our residents, you know, again, saved my life. I've also gained friendships, accountability partners. I loved all the program that you're having. I want to give a shout out to Fit DC before my weight loss journey. The only thing I was running was my mouth. Now I run 5Ks, all the DC, all the Fit. I try to participate in all the 5Ks, all the activities. Um, Fit DC3, I definitely follow their motto by body to keep my body in shape, mind participating in the weekly meditation classes and community, going to the events throughout the city. Um, I like to thank, give a special shout out to Michael Lightfoot and Sherman Nelson, who were equally instrumental in saving my life. I like to thank Sherman for being one of my coaches and Mr. Mike for being one of my coaches. And thank them for this, thank Sherman for the staff that he has hired and for all the programs they have incorporated. Since I started with DPR in 2009, I do yoga, I do boot camp, I do aquatics, I do quite a few. I go through different things throughout the city because I do have an automobile, so I wanna go where I wanna go and where I feel most comfortable. I love the fact that we're getting, getting a vaccine center in Fort Lincoln. I'm so excited about that. My only um, down concerns only two things. The, um, the machine at the Vumsey Aquatic Center, the, the dry your um, swimwear has been broken for several months. I understand there was a request put in. Can you find out the status on that? And in Deanwood, when we do yoga in the gym, it's, it's like the heating system, like the HVAC system sound like it's, it's about to crash any second. Those are my only two things. I'm not gonna be long with it and hold people's time. But again, I would like to thank the awesome, awesome, awesome programming that DC Parks and Recs provides for our residents. Thank you for your time and fitness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Charlene Hersey. I can, Ms. Charlene Hersey, I can see you on the screen, but I can't, I don't see you in your face. Ms. Hersey, on once, on twice. So, all right, and we, we don't see Rochelle Hari uh, in the queue either. Okay, Ms. Hersey, I see you. Yes. You gotta unmute yourself. You have to, un there we go, you unmute it now. Me. If, you if you can talk, if the mic is working or not. Okay, uh, green. You hear? Me? Yes, but it's choppy. So maybe you should talk a little bit, and I can probably give you some advice if it's not working. It's choppy. So cut your screen off and see if the vocal work by itself. Yes. Reception is not good. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, Good afternoon, Karen White. Uh, the reception is really bad. If you can cut your screen off, it may come clear. We can't hear anything.
If you cut your screen off and try, it's choppy again. Uh, can you try to use your cell phone or another device? Still can't hear. Can hear me? Yeah, it's coming in and out, but no, I can't. I cannot hear a full sentence. So what we'll do is we're going to. I'm going to thank everyone who testified at this last panel. Um, we're going to continue to move on because we have to close this out uh, by three o'clock. We're way behind schedule. Um, and so we'll give you an opportunity, Ms. Hersey, in the next panel. We'll go to uh, two people and come back to you to see if you worked out the kinks in that. I can see you, I just can't hear you. Yep. Um, I did want to note, I saw Commissioner Paul Johnson. Yes. Ms. Hersey, if you can mute it and then try to work that out. We got to continue on because we are live. Okay, we have Dion McCoy, Darius Watts, Lauren Green, Ulanda Perkins, Ms. Hershey, while you're waiting, are you using a Wi-Fi at a facility or a house? Is it a Wi-Fi connection? You can nod or shake your head because we can't hear the, the, the audio. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Still breaking up. It's Dion McCoy, Darius Watts. Lauren Green. I haven't seen them being elevated to the screen. Okay, I see Dr. Jackson promoting them. Okay. If you can mute it for the time being, Ms. Hersey, it'll be helpful to us. Thank you. Dion, Corey, I can see you say, can you hear me? No, we can't hear you or see you. My staff said they're elevating you to the panel. So just give us one second. All right, I'm here. Good morning, council members and, and Director Hunter, DPR family and distinguished guests. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, go right ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, my name is Dion Corey. I'm testifying on the behalf of DPR, Roman leaders. I just wanna give you a little background about myself and uh, the importance of being a Roman leader. Uh, I love my job and, and how I make a difference in my community. Growing up near the Kennedy Recreation Center taught me a lot, being in the streets, to become a man and a role model for a lot of kids, including my own. Please understand, I know and understand how to uh, engage youth and motivate them to participate in recreational activities. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, the mobile recreational activities that we conduct uh, last summer in War 8, like uh, Oxen Run community. Uh, so much remind me of my own community. The kids have learned and respect and trust me. As, uh, as a Rover leader, we often wear many hats. In, in some cases, we are uh, recreators, big brothers, uh, father figures, and, uh, and in crisis situations. We are the voice of reasons, uh, de-escalating uh, crisis situations, I know I've made a big impact over the summer throughout the city. 
I built multi relationship with kids. I'm sorry, with kids from all four quadrants. I've been through a lot. I almost lost my own life. So I know how it is for these young dudes to uh, get caught up into this this lifestyle and things like that. Uh, we need more Roman leaders to provide consistent mentoring to our kids at a risk and encourage them to do better, such as staying in school, getting a good job. I want the kids to really learn from my mistakes. These are better opportunities. It's better opportunities out here nowadays. And I believe every kid should take advantage of having a Roman leader as a mentor. Uh, our job is to prevent and help the youth. And I, and I didn't have that really growing up. It feel great, you know what I mean? Walking away knowing I put smiles on kids' faces and, uh, you know, uh, we managed it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Opportunities like this and not only help the community, but give the youth something to look forward to and develop their motive and social skills. Uh, showing the youth that we care and look forward to engaging them with recreational activities in their neighborhoods. Uh, is critical. As a junior rover leader and a mentor DPR family, we do every day as, as impactful. In closing, I would like to say thank you to the DPR family as we continue to grow for gold. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to serve my community and the opportunity, the opportunity for me to testify. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Darius Watts coming right behind me. Okay, great. No, no, you're not. Okay. How y'all doing? Good on yourself. Got to know my fat. We got to know council members, director Hunter, and distinguished guests. My name is Darius Watts. I'm a long-standing resident of the Seven, the Seven Oak Street community. I respectfully come before you today to testify on behalf of the DPR Roman Leader Program. A little bit about myself. I'm a returning citizen. I spent some years locked up making one dumb decision. I was forced to sit down, thinking about everything that has happened to me in my life. I survived incarceration. I knew I had to make a change. I returned home in 2019 looking for an opportunity to make a difference. It must be noted. While well, locked up, two of my closest friends took a different route and got jobs with DPR roving leaders. I was impressed and saw the work that they did. Initially, I worked odd jobs to keep myself busy and out of trouble. I was still looking for a career opportunity. I continue to watch my friends and the Roman leaders make a difference in the community that we grew up in. They cared about our community as they continue to resolve and de-escalate beefs. They also did exciting things like taking our neighborhood kids on trips and provide special programs at the recreation center. They kept the kids away from all the craziness that was going on around 7th Street. It was also the same two friends who in the summer of 2021 told me about the summer high with the Roman Leaders Program. I saw an opportunity for me to make a difference and give back to my community. I jumped at the chance to be a part of making a difference, preventing you from making poor decisions. Poor decisions that almost ruined my life. In 2021, I was hired as a seasonal along with 49 others. Through my hard work and the leadership of the senior Roman leaders, I became one of 14 people who got extended and offered the opportunity to become a junior Roman leader. I am currently working directly with the mobile recreation team that provided recreational activities throughout the entire city. Roman leaders mobile recreation team went to some of the toughest cities in the city to provide neighborhood based recreation activities. We also went to some of the most diverse parts of the city as well. We engaged people from all walks of life. My favorite was attending a special needs camp at DPR's Therapeutic Center. Putting a smile on the kid's face meant so much. That was the change I was looking for. Having the kids from my community look up to me and see something positive. In closing, I can't wait to see and I can't wait to see and be a part of the role with this impact as we move into Kennedy Recreation Center. I know we will, I know for a fact we will be making a real change. 
Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify and for your continued support for the DPR role in this program. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother. Go, oh, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Go for gold. Go for gold. That's what it is. All right, got you, bro. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Lauren Green. <laughs> Is Miss Green here today? Okay, I don't see Miss Green. Ulanda Perkins. Going once, going twice. I see we also joined by Council Member Janice Lewis George. Four, four. Also, Ward 7, Councilman Vincent Gray. And we'll get to them in just a minute. Okay. Uh, Kimberly Wiggins. Hillary Kaser. I know it's difficult being in the back of the list. You got to wait all day to see if you're going to get called. We got to figure out a mechanism to alert and note people when they're going to come up so we're going to lose people's uh, valuable insight into these hearings. Is Ms. Hersey available? Are you able to get your microphone working, Ms. Hersey? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Councilman White, other committee members and residents. My name is Charlene Hersey, a member of the Season Seniors of Fort Stan Recreation Center in Southeast Washington, D.C., Ward 8. I am a longtime resident of the community of Fort Stan, right across the street from the center. I remember we had the circular building on Erie Street Southeast before the new building. As a point of reference, we could use more space to expand the senior room. In 2014, I retired and was searching for something to do that would motivate me to move, socialize with others like me, stimulate my mind, and allow me to tour the city's gifts culturally and educationally. This is why we established a group we call the Seasoned Seniors of Fort Stanton Recreation Center. I was attracted to the program with the seniors who had the same agenda. We have been together since the spring of 2014. This is a tight knit group led by Mr. Lewis P. Jones, Senior Program Manager. He leads us by allowing the group to formulate its own activities and events which fit our needs and talents. As seasoned seniors, we have benefited from structured exercise program, nutrition classes, health wellness classes, and diabetes health, uh, heart health classes from outside resources when available to us. We, it has been difficult for us to obtain instructors for the following classes, so we teach them to our fellow seniors ourselves, such as arts and crafts, sewing, quilting, jewelry making, card making, and wreath making, which Mr. Jones is an expert. We are a talented group of seasoned seniors, so hire us as instructors. We are strong advocates for seniors and city services. We have participated in hearings at the Wilson Building for the Department on Aging and Community Living, for the Department of Parks and Rec, Rec and DC budget as a whole. We have even had the privilege to sit down with our mayor, Muriel Bowser, to voice our concerns. And, that, and we have also met with you, Councilman White, at the Fort Stanton Recreation Center, if you remember. We are strong at the Fort Stanton Recreation Center. The seasoned seniors are supportive of the youth programs 
with in-kind donations for their special events or activities. Whenever DPR needed volunteers for a special events, such as breast cancer awareness, multi-generational fishing trip, and DPR's all hands on deck day, we were available to help. As a vibrant and active senior group at Fort Stanton, all we ask is when we need transportation to an event, DPR responds efficiently. We thank DPR for the long awaited embroidery machine, but we now need an instructor, instructor to teach us how to use it. We would like several sewing machines, the ability to have movie day at the center, better Wi-Fi capability at the center and wall storage cabinets put in our senior room. A quilting machine would be great since we have some quilters to spread skill to our young people. We look good, we look good. You have a whole city to consider when you make your plan less equitable. No more or no less than any ward, but look at the needs and wants of the citizen of the wards. What we need and want in Ward 8 may not be the priority in Ward 1. What we need and want at Fort Stanton Recreation Center Senior Program may not be high on the list for Fort Stevens Senior Program. Just look at each particular senior program and allocate accordingly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And you all have indeed been a remarkable asset to advocating on, at the hearings on the front line. And I miss seeing you guys in person. Hope to see you guys soon. Um, I did want to thank the, the, the young men uh, who spoke today as well, um, Dion and Darius. I think that's indicative of what we want to see happen with our youth and young adults that grow up in the city have an opportunity to be a part of, not, uh, of the solution. Um, I think that's important, especially in the roving leaders division of DPR with the fine men and when we have there on the front line, front lines in the trenches doing God's work. So I want to thank you. Um, I don't know. I see you have Miss Kaylin Wilson here with Yolanda Perkins, uh, who is your mom and daughter. There we go. If you can cut your mic on and go right ahead. Okay, hello and good afternoon council members. My name is Kaylin Wilson, daughter of Kimberly Wiggins, and today I would like to share my experience with DPR cheer. I'm a sixth grader at DCI International Public Charter School, and I cheer on the Emory team and DC's elite team. This will be my fifth year cheering. I'm not sure if you can see the scars through Zoom, but four years ago, I was bitten by bitten in the face by a dog. Since then, I've had three re re reconstructive surgeries. As you can imagine, that is a quite a bit trauma for a young lady such as myself. I really looked down on myself and struggled with my self-confidence, but, but my cheer sisters and coaches helped me see that I am more than these scars. And they helped me realize that these scars do not define who I am. To me, cheer is more than learning routines and doing doing stunts. Don't get me wrong, all of that, all of that is fun, especially co competing, co competing and winning. But our coaches motivate us to be great beyond the mat. They inspire us to do well in school and encourage us to dream big. Gr grades matter. They, as much, as much as perfecting a toe touch having practice four days a week has taught me manage time after school. Pro procrastinating is never a good option. I love cheer. Thank you, Coach Kiana, for creating a space for me and the new learning techniques. Meet girls from across the city and feel like I belong. I no longer feel like I have to hide my perfectly imperfect smile. Being a tween, Tween isn't easy, but cheer gives me something to look forward to after a long day at school. Please continue to fund our family, I mean program, 
and maybe if you could add a few extra dollars so other young ladies could do could have the benefit of cheer too thank you for allowing me to me the opportunity to speak today thank you miss wilson we appreciate to hear the voice of the young people like yourselves is very eloquent smart uh, and giving a voice to all those who may not be able to make it today uh, as relates to cheer and other related activities. I wanna thank you for joining us today and adding your input. You did a remarkable job. Um, is Hillary Kaser here? Abby Nelson? If you all don't come on, we have to keep going because we are pressed with time. My staff is texting me, messaging me. Um, so let me swing back uh, to, we have our Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George. Do you have any opening remarks or any questions for this panel? Uh, yeah, I will be brief. Um, thank you, Chairman White, and thank you to our witnesses for making time to speak with us today. Um, I, you know, our public parks, recreation centers, and pools um, improve the health and well being for all of our residents. Um, and they help provide important joy and fun in all of our lives. Um, as a DC native, um, I remember spending a lot of my time, me and my brothers um, and my sisters, uh, we cheered. I was also a cheerleader. Um, and uh, my brother played on the football team. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just a place of, of, of refuge for us as a community. Um, and it still is that today. Um, I think the pandemic has made us all appreciate sort of the value uh, of exercise and fresh air. And I'm glad we have so many public witnesses to share how we uh, can improve the operations of our parks and recreations department as well. Um, you know, DPR plays a critical role in providing safe and enriching uh, experiences for our young people, uh, particularly over the summer when the schools are closed. Um, they have uh, stepped up uh, during this pandemic um, and done an amazing job, uh, whether it was hosting or being the site of uh, a vaccine clinic, um, whether, whether it was providing food uh, during breaks, but also after school, uh, DPR staff has really stepped up to the plate. So today, my questions really is, one, my, today it is a, a huge thank you to our DPR staff um, uh, in Ward 4 and across the city uh, for the work that they've done and stepped up during this pandemic in various ways. Um, and gotten creative and been a support system. Uh, but in two, it's also to ask questions sort of about a few of our DPR uh, programs and facilities in Ward 4. Um, we have a number of uh, facilities in Ward 4. Uh, although we have received some modernizations, um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we have Emory, Emory Heights um, uh, Recreation Center uh, with a, a field that still needs updating with programming, more programming that they would like to do. Um, they, you know, the young people there have asked to be able to have a presser to be able to do, uh, create t-shirts. Um, uh, they've asked for a, a number of programming they would like to see. Uh, we've gone over to Petworth. Uh, Petworth has asked uh, to bring back a lot of the programs they had. Um, they had a double Dutch program. They had a boot camp program. Um, they also, uh, you know, had the, the young, uh, the Voyager summer program. Um, and so they want more investments in programming. Um, we've heard from uh, Lamont uh, Recreation Center. They need a lot of updates as far as computers go. I've gone there. Uh, they have old computers that don't work um, and very little. And a lot of uh, our young people come there to do their homework. We need working computers. We need more, a better Wi-Fi. Um, uh, we also uh, need to sort of update um, this, the center to be able to have more young people stay there, whether it's having a gaming center, which is what they've asked for to be there. We want to see that happen as well. Up sure, uh, basketball courts have not been upgraded since I was in uh, since I was a young kid and uh, went to Upshur. Uh, and so uh, we're asking for sort of upgrades for the Upshur um, uh, basketball courts and facilities as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm here to give kudos, but also say, you know, there's a lot of our recreation centers, Fort Stevens as well has asked for more programming funding as well as um, more trash cans to keep the area safe. So uh, my question today will really be about how we can get more programming funds and how we can connect with more community partners who want to come in, teach classes, support our young people, support our seniors, um, and really increase uh, um, sort of the participation in our program. So um, I thank you, uh, 
uh, Chairman White for allowing me to be here with you. Um, and I look forward to talking to DPR about improving some of those programming needs um, that we need in our, our, our uh, recreation centers in War 4 and some of the upgrades and modernizations that we're also waiting to have. So thank you so much. I want to thank this entire uh, panel of witnesses, um, especially our young person. I was a cheerleader as well. So I already know it's more than just cheering. Um, it means so much. Um, uh, the reason I'm, you know, in the sorority I'm in today was because my cheerleading coach was uh, an AKA and I was like, I'm going to be just like her. And so it was the discipline, the focus, um, the, the sisterhood, uh, the social emotional learning that we talk about that's needed for public safety that was came about from me being on a cheerleading team in our community. So uh, we definitely need more of that. And I thank you for taking the time to speak as well. So thank you, Chairman, uh, Chairman White. And I look forward to talking to Director Hunter. Thank you. Uh Councilmember Vincent Gray, do you have any questions or, or opening statements for this panel? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will be uh, mercifully brief uh, in my, uh, I appreciate the fact that you called this hearing. Uh, and I do have some questions that I will direct to uh, Director Hunter uh, when we get to that point. So, but, uh, you know, we, 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 as you know, as you know, Mr. Chairman, we, we focus a lot of our energy on uh, DPR and uh, work very closely with uh, Director Hunter uh, as well. Um, we, um, we will probably inquire today a, a good deal about uh, facilities uh, in Ward 7, uh, as you know, and uh, we look forward to being able to ask uh, Director Hunter several questions. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, I uh, did tell Mr. Paul John Commissioner Paul Johnson from Ward Four Petworth, he get a chance to speak. So go right ahead, and we got to keep we got to keep it going. Hi, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Chair Chair Wayne. I really appreciate you working with me. Um, thank you to your colleagues as well, um, Council Members. Uh, Henderson, Council Member Gray. Thank you uh, as well, Council Member Fitz uh, George from Ward 4. Um, I also wanted to, um, you all can hear me okay, right? You're fine? Okay, thank you. I wanted to just add kudos to the to the young people that have spoken and to the future LS, to the uh, roving leaders, and um, wanted to um, have them to stay encouraged um, with their work. So, um, I'm here as um, ANC in Petworth in Ward 4 and 4C07 uh, within, uh, my S within my single member district uh, resides the Petworth Recreation Center and uh, at 8th and Taylor. So um, I wanted to just sort of speak to that and speak to my constituents that use the rec center to give you some feedback in what I'm hearing. Um, if I had to distill the purpose of my talk today, it would be an appeal for um, equitable investment, um, equitable investment in the entirety um, of our community here in Petworth and in Ward 4. Um, demographically, I'm referring to uh, seniors, I'm referring to young people, um, and I would classify that as uh, 10 years of age or older, perhaps to 20, would say students, um, mothers, fathers, and families, and returning citizens. Um, many of these uh, individuals that I mentioned here in Petworth, in this community, are native Washingtonians, are uh, long-term residents, and uh, they reside in uh, multi-generational households, which have, uh, which have needs that uh, DPR and the Petworth Worth Rec Center is uh, to be here to address those needs. Um, our community here in Petworth as well is quite complex. Uh, out of the two stakeholders, it's dynamic, it's historic, and it's important. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk about programmatic gaps um, um, that need to be addressed and need to be flagged. As uh, Council Member Lewis George had mentioned, um, there are issues of food um, insecurity here amongst my constituents and here in Petworth and the DPR programs such as grab and go, such as 
that's after school meals for all the public and charter schools that are here or something that um, does not currently exist that used to exist at Petworth Rec Center. But um, um, I would urge consideration to bring that back, particularly in light of um, the pandemic and the situation that we're in, grab and go meals after school meals. Um, and the facility is equipped for that. Secondly, I would say um, physical health um, and physical exercise, yoga, um, um, fit DC programs. Um, there's been some private partnership that has brought some of that to bear, but we have constituents here who um, drive or take public transportation to other wards to work out, to take a, um, to take a class. And that's not right. Um, our seniors that live across the street or live in the vicinity should be able to go to Petworth Rec Center to take yoga. Even if it has to be outside because of COVID protocols, it's something that I want to flag. Also our youth, um, youth activities for older children, uh, not just toddlers, like T-ball. Um, there are supplies that are needed. There's, there's a DV has um, that they need to funnel to this rec center. There are um, contractors that need to get onboarded better that can provide these services. There's many men and older men and women and residents of the community that want to offer chess programs, rites of passage programs, um, capoeira. Um, there's all kinds of interesting skills that our community has um, and want to partner with the rec center. And um, we, need, um, we need that um, to happen. Um, lastly, I'd like to say that uh, there has been recent beautification efforts um, with the outside facility, with the spray uh, park and with the playground, but problems do exist inside of the facility, okay? Um, I know that there's Raymond, I know that there's Emory, and um, I know that there's Upshur slated in the capital uh, budget program. However, when I had a meeting in uh, Petworth Recreation Center in November with my constituents and um, um, inside of the building, there was no heat. Um, it's never since put in, um, uh, there were HVAC issues, but um, we can't have employees and community members in there with no heat. I'm glad to see that that was rectified, but it's just illustrative of the disconnect between the investments in the outside of the Petworth Recreation Center and the inside. So- um, Appreciate all the I'm time. Wrap it up for us, please. It'd be greatly appreciated. Yes, sir. I, I'll just close with this. Petworth is, uh, according to the last census track, is 43% uh, Black, it's 20 seven percent. We need investments in the full spectrum of our community here. And uh, it goes to affordability, it goes to harmony, it goes to preventative measures for public safety. And thank you for your time. And uh, we're here to work together with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. If we can elevate, I see Director Delana Hunter is here. Um, you good to go, Director? Okay, uh, it is the, as you know, uh, it is the practice of this committee to sway and affirm all government witnesses. Uh, so if you, anyone you have that may be speaking or on the panel, if you can cut your screen on and start by raising your right hand. Sure. Can Deputy Ella Faulkner be elevated to a panelist? Yes, one sec. Oh, there she is. All right. All right, you can stop raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give to the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. All right, Director, you can start with your opening statement. Good afternoon, Chairperson White, committee members, and stakeholders joining us today. I'm Delano Hunter, Director of the DC Department of Parks and Recreation. And I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of Mayor Bowser to discuss our performance during fiscal years 21 and 22 to date. I want to thank Mayor Bowser, City Administrator Donahue, and Deputy Mayor for Education Kind for their ongoing leadership. Our success over the last 12 months can be directly attributed to the dedication and commitment of my DPR colleagues. They have a can-do attitude, 
and go above and beyond the traditional role of a recreator to serve our public. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the DPR employees that have passed away over the last 12 months and thank them for their commitment to the agency. Mr. Larry Kinney, Mr. Roger Pete, Mr. Clarence Anderson, Mrs. Tracy Lane Gadsen, Mr. Ricardo Duren, Mr. Luther Lindsay, Mr. Lonnie Perrin, Ranger Robert Gill, and Mr. LaVon Stagg. I wanna reaffirm my commitment to ensuring that my colleagues have the resources that they need to safely provide the programs and services that we take great pride in offering. DPR's mission is to provide equitable access to program services and facilities. Our vision is to be America's gold standard for urban park and recreation agencies. In 2021, Washington DC was once again named as having the best park system in the nation amongst the 100 largest city by the Trust for Public Land. Local investments were cited as leading the way and providing equitable access. DPR manages an inventory of 68 recreation centers, 34 pools, 35 splash parks, 113 athletic fields, 19 dog parks, and over 900 acres of park space. Below are several examples of how DPR delivered in FY21. As early as October 2020, DPR safely provided access to lap lanes at our aquatic centers, and individual reservations at our fitness centers. We executed a phased approach to safe permitting of DPR fields for sports and events, issuing over 74,000 permits in FY21 and over 28,000 permits thus far in FY22. We brought back an important DC tradition by reopening 100% of our outdoor pools and spray parks last summer. We hosted our summer camps for 5,600 children while piloting boost camps for nearly 700 students in partnership with six DCPS and charter schools. We engaged 900 young people through our continued work with the Marion S. Berry Summer Youth Employment Program, offering teen career camps for youth ages 14 through 15 and direct workplace experience for youth ages 16 and older. Our role in leaders connected with over 3,000 youth through engaging programs and activities. In addition to core recreation, we are proud of our continued efforts to support the district's ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic by providing the following vital services. When vaccines became available, DPR answered the call and hosted many of the district's first COVID-19 vaccination sites, vaccinating nearly 75,000 individuals in FY21. We continue to host pop-up vaccination and testing sites including our 14 test yourself sites where residents can pick up and drop off their PCR kits. In support of our efforts to combat food insecurity, DPR summer meals programs distributed over 180,000 meals to children ages 18 and younger, an increase of roughly 75,000 over the prior summer. Working with our partners at the Department of Human Services, we temporarily converted Langdon, King Greenleaf and Sherwood to emergency shelters for our unhoused residents during the most challenging periods of the pandemic. Now we would like to discuss how DPR is supporting the district's recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic through recreation. DPR received 2.6 million in federal funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. And I'll tell you about a few of those initiatives. To help students accelerate their learning, we launched Boost Camps, which incorporates traditional elements of recreation, like swimming and arts and crafts with high impact tutoring for students in grades pre-K through eight. We serve nearly 700 students through our partnerships with six DCPS and public charter schools. And we're excited to expand boost camps to even more locations as we scale up the program this summer. In addition to engaging over 3000 youth through our safe passage and special events with our roving leaders, we connected with over 1000 youth through its mobile at the Metro project, hosting nearly 50 mobile recreation activations at 13 Metro stops in partnership with WMATA. As a part of our work with Building Blocks, our roving leaders engaged almost 800 people in positive youth engagement activities through 20 mobile activations in neighborhoods currently experiencing high incidence of gun violence, advancing the district's comprehensive violence prevention strategy. Through our late night programming, we engaged over 16,000 residents with community events such as Late Night Hype, which can best be described as a traveling recreation festival, partnering with local organizations 
to expand the We Own the Night basketball tournament to include locations in Ward 8. And also we held late night tournaments that were very popular at Rosedale and Emory Heights. Through Fit DC, Mayor Biles' signature fitness initiatives, we delivered a series of engaging and dynamic workouts with popular fitness trainers in wards five, seven, and eight. Locations, including ward four, included Petworth, Brentwood, Berry Farm, Fort Davis, Woody Ward, and Douglas. Now let's talk about how we are working to ensure that our facilities adapt to the district's changing needs through our ready to play master plan. In FY21, we made strides in finalizing ready to play to guide the agency's capital investment for the next 20 years. Ready to play consists of strategic plan with an equity framework and an interactive site prioritization tool. I wanna to thank our capital projects team for their commitment to this project. They undertook an exhaustive analysis of the district's current and future needs and examine district assets using the latest planning and design advancements. The capital projects teams work creatively to execute a robust community engagement process, collecting comments on more than 200 locations from over 6,000 individuals through online meetings, a dedicated voicemail line, pop-up in-person visits, and our ready to play website, readytoplaydc.com. Throughout this feedback process, residents express a strong interest in investment in outdoor recreation and highlighted the importance of maintenance and enhancements at existing locations, including parks, recreation centers, and our aquatic facilities. Additionally, residents prioritize the need for equitable access to diverse recreation experiences. DPR released the findings of Ready to Play Citywide Survey and a draft for the core components of our strategic plan and equity framework in summer 2021 for public comment. We look forward to releasing the finalized Ready to Play Master Plan this fiscal year. In FY21, DPR worked with our partners at the Department of General Services to deliver 32 capital improvement projects with the total budget of 82 million. I would like to take a few minutes to highlight a few of these projects that have enriched the lives of residents across the district. In Ward 1, we finished phase two improvements to the park at LaDroit including a new splash park, picnic tables, shade structures, and lighting. In Ward 2, we reopen or open the revitalized Franklin Park with our partners at the Downtown Business Improvement District and the National Park Service. We also opened the fully renovated Shaw Skate Park or Shaw Park complete with the skate park visited by skateboard legend Tony Hawk and a new athletic field, track, basketball court, outdoor exercise equipment, and a dog park. In Ward 3, we completed the renovation of the Hardy Recreation Center, including an addition to the Recreation Center building and a new playground, splash park, and renovations to the existing ball field. In Ward 4, we opened the newly renovated and renamed Lafayette Point and Recreation Center with a completely new building using a nature-informed design and extensive holistic stormwater management system across the property. In Ward 5, we completed a much needed replacement of the HVAC system at Turkey Thicket Aquatic Center, providing reliable access to swimming and aquatic programming year round. In Ward 6, we transformed the Eastern Market Metro Park by installing a new playground, splash park, and a performance pavilion. In Ward 7, we reopened the newly renamed and fully renovated Woody Ward Recreation Center complete with a state-of-the-art boxing gym, fitness room, dance studio, and basketball courts. This is also where Mayor Bowser and many residents, including some of our youngest, gathered on Memorial Day 21 to kick off the opening and return of our DPR pools. In Ward 8, we bought residents a fully rebuilt Fairby Hope Recreation Center, an indoor pool in partnership with KIPP DC. With the council's addition of 13 million in FY21, we are working with our partners at DGS to update the design of the new Congress Heights Recreation Center to include an indoor pool. In conclusion, we continue to be a part of the core of the quality of life for district residents. In addition to providing our gold standard recreation services, facilities, and programs, we are a hub for our communities and we embrace this. We provide kids with access to nutritional meals, the public with access to essential testing and vaccination services as a part of our ongoing fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and vital resources for youth, seniors and residents of all ages to connect with their peers and realize personal growth and development. 
we're embedded in this community and we value the residents that residents place in us to deliver these services at a high level. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Chairman White. I'd like to thank the members of the committee uh, for your time today for this hearing. I also wanna thank uh, our residents and our stakeholders that took time out of their busy schedules to, to testify. And the one thing I appreciate about you, uh, Chairman White, is that you will go through each panel and you'll highlight those questions to make sure that we get answers uh, on a record. And boy, am I eager to respond to some of our stakeholders. Uh, so with that being said, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, I wanna recognize Ella Faulkner, our Deputy Director of Recreation Services. She is joining us today. Uh, and we're gonna try to get you questions to uh, all of the answers that you have. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we can start my clock. That'd be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you, Director. So I'll jump into some of the preliminary questions as mentioned during some of the testimonies before I get to some of my uh, questions my staff has. Uh, uh, the Cromwell School, uh, you know, you, you heard, I'm sure you heard the conversation about the community engagement and them trying to get answers to where you guys are with the design and construction. Can you speak to, to where you all are and who's gonna be communicating with them to ensure they have an adequate stream of communication? Um, I know they mentioned uh, Mr. Tommy as one of the sources that they communicate with, but if you can elaborate on that, that'd be helpful. Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, I would uh, like to know the specifics of Ms. Stuckey's uh, experience. Uh, I love hearing from our young person. So if she could email me, I would love to know about that specific uh, situation. I think when you heard from the commissioners and other stakeholders, they mentioned uh, that we have an open line of engagement with the community and we share what we know. Uh, at this time, that, that, that project uh, uh, has been funded. We are performing uh, a stabilization study. As you know, this is an historic building uh, and this will be the oldest DPR facility that we've renovated I want to say in our history, that building is at least 120, 140 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is going to take great care. Uh, this will not be like a traditional project uh, because of some of the historic considerations. Uh, so that stabilization report uh, is scheduled to be completed by the end of this fiscal year. At that same time, we'll work with DGS to ensure that we bring a design firm on board, and then we'll be able to begin uh, our community engagement process in earnest. But uh, we're really excited. And also, uh, I'm proud of the uh, temporary uh, recreation accommodations that we were able to deliver uh, this summer. Uh, so I, I'll look into that, Ms. Stuckey's uh, concerns, but I think if you speak with the, the uh, community and the commissioners, uh, we, we may not have all of the answers, but we pride ourselves on, on being responsive and, and keeping that open line of communication. When, when we know, they will know. Thank you. I think we've also heard extensive testimony uh, from Riggs LaSalle uh residents as well and the uh, egregious conditions of the building and, and the outside facility uh have you uh, and your staff uh been in communication about a solution to address those issues there and i think i heard it was built in 2008 um but i guess 2022 is not holding up and significant repairs need to be done yeah, I really appreciate those uh, stakeholders because they're, they're engaged uh, and I have a lot of respect for the work that they do. Mr. Oliver, Ms. Cockrell, I'd like to thank you so much. And they work hand in hand with the site manager, Shalita Settles, uh, who does a great job of partnering with them. And I think they highlighted uh, the, the good things that are happening at the center. They talked about the citywide tournaments that that team has won. Uh, we launched for the first time a high school internship program. And that site is number one in the city for the number of signups. So there's a lot to celebrate ballet, uh, piano, uh, some of the bread and butter pre-pandemic programs are returning to rigs. Now, uh, there are some challenges with the facilities uh, and uh, I can say specifically for rigs that there is funding to replace that HVAC project. Uh, and as been our pattern in recent years, that HVAC system rather, as been our pattern in recent years, uh, as with Tacoma that's happening now, Turkey Thicket, uh, Lamont and, and Deanwood, uh, we have been replacing these HVAC systems uh, that are, are, are struggling to, 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 to uh, you know, meet the demands of, of residents and the needs of that facility. Thank you. And I also heard from Fort Stanton uh, seniors, well, seasoned citizens, um, and they request to get more activities, instructor, mm -hmm. um, sewing classes, uh, and the like. Uh, is there a plan to uh, uh, 
adjust programming there to fit the needs of the youth and older adults there at that facility? Uh, th there is, if you recall, and I'm sure you remember this, uh, in previous uh, hearings, getting that embroidery machine was a priority. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, it wasn't cheap. It was about $35,000 or $40,000, uh, but we were able to do it. Uh, and it was just delivered this past quarter, just before the holidays. So the next step is programming, right? Because it does take a, a specialized skill set to operate it. Uh, and we'll have something launched this spring to bring those embroidery classes back uh, to uh, the seniors at Air Force Stanton or, or to introduce that. I'm, I'm really happy about that. And, and thank you. We've talked about this offline. We know that was a priority. Uh, and again, I want to thank those residents over at Fort Stan. They are highly engaged. They volunteer. They come to the events. They're just a great model of what uh, collaboration should look like between the agency and our stakeholders. Thank you. I've heard a lot of concerns regarding long-term leases from DPI. Mm -hmm. You got the community with a list of any long-term contract and leases uh, and your thoughts regarding that. Um, th there is some concerns about oversight and accountability as it relates to these long-term leases. You can email me the actual list because uh, we can come back and follow back up doing that, doing the budget oversight hearing. But I want to know your stake as the, the director of the agency about how we should be looking at these long-term leases. Well, if uh, thank you. Thank you for that. If we haven't provided that already, I'll make sure we get that to you in short order. Uh, I, I just want to provide just some context. It's important that a, a lot of those leases uh, date back beyond this mayoral administration. Uh, many of the leases that are, are referenced date back to the early to mid to 2000s. So uh, that is important to note. Uh, but there have been other recent updates that, that govern how we go about doing this. Uh, that 2014 regulations that are often cite for our priority of use agreement that kind of lays out uh, our, our ranking order and our priority order for permits, you know, that is what we closely uh, follow. And then also more, more recently, uh, when we are presented with uh, opportunities to, to partner and it includes the construction of, of assets and as a joint use, we tie the length of that lease and that agreement to the, uh, to the, to the lifespan of that asset. Uh, now, I want to specifically address the, uh, the, the mention of the ARC. Uh, Council member, you, you know, you know, well, how much value the ARC brings to the community with the Bishop Walker School uh, and the facilities that are along Mississippi Avenue. I think that's a great example of a public private partnership uh, that was site was not utilized. It was a, a open field. Uh, so I think it is appropriate in certain instances when you have uh, capital investments that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that you have a, a lease mechanism in place for that. So that that's sort of my 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 thoughts on just that. It, it's, it's nuanced, but th those are my, my thoughts on that matter. Thank you. I'll digress to move on to Council Member Wolf for Janice Lewis George. Thank you, Council Member White, um, and good to see you, Director Hunter, you. Um, as well as Ms. Faulkner. Uh, thank you both. Um, as I said before, I just want to say your DPR staff in War 4 has just been doing a phenomenal job from the managers to the staff, um, really showing up in a great way. And I truly appreciate that. I want to make sure you send the love to them uh, that they deserve uh, for that. Um, most of the issues that are happening in War 4 seem to be maintenance based. So it looks like most of that I'm going to have to cover with DGS. Um, but a few things that I just want to run through with you are some of the programming things and how and what how we can make those happen. Um, so how do you how does it work if we want to add sort of additional programming to any of our recreation centers? So, for example, Petworth has asked for a double Dutch program they, um, that they had before. They've asked for um, a, a, a boot camp. How does it work? Do you all sort of have your own contractors? How do you allocate sort of programming to the to the different recreation centers? Um, and, and how do we go about sort of infusing programming in each of our recreation centers based on their ask for that? Sure, it, it's a fluid process. Uh, and my approach or our approach to programming the facility is sort of threefold, right? So uh, first you have DPR programs and activities is based sometime upon the skill set of the staff or contract dollars that we have for that. We also look at permits. There's sometimes a private programs or community-based organizations that, that seek access and we pride ourselves on providing that access and then also leisure usage. So we're always trying to find that balance, right? To determine the ecosystem uh, for a specific community. Uh, we can certainly, you know, take a look uh, at Petworth. I'm not familiar with uh, every aspect of it, but I, you know, there is some context I think this is important. Uh, we had a, a 
a well attended and really popular Fit DC activation there in November, uh, right. which was well received by the community. And I, I can't remember the constituent's name, uh, but I really pre appreciate our partnership because we work hand in hand and we had determined uh, that we, we didn't think with, with the emergence of Delta, we heard from a lot of our staff and our contractors that they didn't mm -hmm. feel comfortable having those fitness classes in tight quarters where we had some HVAC challenges. So uh -huh. we, we did select in that instance to move that program, I believe, to Raymond. Uh, and I, I recognize the sort of impact that that can have on the community. It, it's our hope that once we get through uh, COVID, you know, and, mm -hmm. and various variants, that we can get back to more of a normal sort of pattern of programs okay. uh, at that site. Okay, what about the food and meals? Because we mm -hmm. that's been brought up as far as nutrition, uh, you know, nutrition sites uh, and Petworth sort of has sort of some food and nutrition issues. What about, uh, can we get a food, food and um, meals program at the Petworth location? Yeah, that, that'll be activated this summer. Okay, it'll be activated this summer. Okay, it, it will, it will. We'll return with our summer's, summer meals program at Petworth this summer. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know uh, Councilman White just covered it, but there, I think it, it looks like the list for Lamont, sort of the um, the updates that are needed for those are, are pretty sort of se uh, severe updates that are, are needed. Um, I'm just gonna ask that you, I guess me, you and Director uh, An um, Anderson can get together and sort of walk go through the list. Maybe we can have a walkthrough at the center and just go through all the outstanding DGS requests. I will That's, welcome that. Okay, let's let's do that. Um, I want to ask about um, how we're doing with uh, our roving leaders program, um, and sort of how many roving leaders we sort of have uh, assigned to. Uh, I guess Ward Four. Do have we retained the same number of roving leaders? If so, how many? Um, and are we looking at expanding to any more? Sure. Uh I'd like to thank Mayor Bowser and the Building Blocks DC initiative uh, for uh, the investment of federal funding to support the work of the roving leaders. Uh, currently we have two full-time roving leaders that are in war four. Uh, you, you know Coach Rob and the great work that he does with Safe Passage and, and at Roosevelt uh, and uh, the, the, the other escapes me, but she does a, a great job as well. Uh, in addition to that, we have hired uh, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor is her name. I want to acknowledge her, her work. Uh, but we also uh, have a number of seasonal roving leaders that we have extended. I think you heard from, I'm not sure if you were here for uh, Darius and, and the other young man mm -hmm. had that really compelling tele testimony. And they're from the 7th and O community. And they are just two right. of, I believe, 10 or 11 that we have extended that sort of play a city-wide role. And even any given day, I'll compliment our roving leaders at various locations about the, the, the city. So that, that's sort of where we are. Um, we stood up mobile activations at metros this, this year, which is the first time that we've done that to sort of have a more dynamic presence in support of safe passage. So that work will continue and Petworth has been a priority site for those activations. Okay, great. I wanna ask about Tacoma. My seniors are very anxious. They wanna know when it's opening. I think we had a tentative February. Um, um, they're like, I don't see anybody. <laughs> I don't see many people in there working. Is it going to open? What's the update on, on Tacoma's pool? Um, and then also our seniors in Warfare want to have a meeting with you about Tacoma Aquatic Pool because they would like to have um, their morning, uh, what do you call it? I don't know what you call it. It's like morning in the water. What do you call it? What do you call it? Uh, water aerobics. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Water aerobics. <laughs> um, and they want a section for them for their water aerobics. So two questions there. When is it expected to come opening? And are you willing to meet with the seniors about their uh, aquatic needs? Uh, yeah, yes, certainly. Uh, always willing to meet. Uh, and the last update we have from DGS and the contract is March 21st. Uh, and we can't wait. Uh, but I want to thank you because uh, opening up Roosevelt and that, that public entrance and the staffing to support those public hours. I know it's not a replacement, uh, but uh, it, it has helped. And then also we know that war, many War IV residents travel to Turkey Thicket and I'm proud to report that that HVAC system was replaced and yeah. that facility reopened in October. Uh, so we, 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 okay. I mean, we're, we're, eager, we're, we're eager for Tacoma. It's our largest facility and we can't wait okay. to get back in it. Great, I'm glad to hear. Um, want to ask about um, weekend. But here's here's the issue. The only time I get calls is on the weekends because people want to use the bathroom at some of our facilities, mm -hmm. and that seems to be like the like that's where I get calls on the weekend about it not being open, and then I gotta mm -hmm. call you on the weekend and bother you about it. 
So can we get to like, uh, for example, you know, Emory, um, we got reports that families didn't have access to the bathrooms inside of Emory over the weekends. And that, that led to young people peeing on the field, which was a problem because that was one of our newer fields. So can you just say more um, about, uh, and we heard the same thing at Petworth, like the, and they have that really nice playground and all the kids go and play there yeah. and they can't use the bathroom there. So can you just say more about DPR's policies around weekend access to facilities and particular bathrooms so we can you know, be clear on those things. Right, I I'm sensitive to that. Uh, as the father of a six-year-old and four-year-old that utilize our facilities, I, I know the, uh, uh, the, the, the urgency uh, sometimes of getting to a restroom. When, when a kid has to go, they has to go. Uh, yeah. And it's easy, of course, at a site like Petworth where you can, you can and, and Tacoma near those tennis courts where you can access the bathroom uh, without having to enter the facility. Uh, so we, as you know, expanded access to those and got those uh, back open and serviced in partnership with DGS. It's a little more complicated with our indoor facilities where you don't have that sort of external uh, ability to access it. Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to work with your office on it. It's not as cut and dry. You know, our, our centers typically, uh, we, we have enough staff to support sometimes 80 some hours of operations. Uh, uh -huh. To do those others, it, it would be a lift. Uh, and, and we'd have to think strategically about where and where, where and when to do that. Okay, great. Um, okay, I have a number of other questions. What I'm going to do is send them to Councilmember White because I have to go do a uh, traffic safety walkthrough in Sherwood Park with uh, uh, Director Lott. So thank you so much. Um, let's do sort of a DGS DPR togetherness because most of the issues are DGS, but then they'll say some of them are DPR. So I just want us to go around to each of our ward centers and get on the same page. And I think we'll be good to go. That comes from locks to bathrooms to other facilities issues. Let, let's do it. And I just can't thank you enough for your partnership on Roosevelt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and we do have a lot of outstanding issues with DGS. So absolutely, uh, I'll be there. Um, and Director Hunter, I want to ask if you can stay past 3 o'clock. I think our hearing was set from 12 to 3. But we have a number of council members here. And we want to try to get to some of their questions if that works for you. It, it does, council member, we've never had a, a, a three hour hearing. So they, they always tend to be four and six. I, I, I told my wife not to expect me before seven. So I'm, I'm yours for the next four hours. Okay, so we got you to seven. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so council member Christina Henderson was here first actually. So we'll double back to her to see if she have any uh, questions. Uh, thank you, council member White and uh, good afternoon, director Hunter. Uh, I'm stealing, uh, I'm just gonna jump right in because we got, I got a lot and I don't got a lot of time. Uh, I'm gonna steal what Chairman Mendelson did once and I'm gonna give you a visual if you could see behind me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Marvin Gaye playground, okay? And the neighbors over there have been blowing it up in terms of the level of disrepair that that playground has fallen to, which is unfortunate because it was just redone not that long ago and yet we have issues with the slide, the fence has fallen down, divots in the, you know, this is the swing area, you know, that's all black now, that used to be green and vibrant. And I, so I'm curious, um, what are the metrics that DPR uses to determine the order in which playgrounds are renovated? Sure. Like, I, we, I'm real clear on what the capital plan looks like for, say, mm, schools or for mm, libraries. I don't really know how you all are choosing the metrics in, in terms of who goes when. Sure, sure. That, that, that's a. Let me answer in this order. Specifically related to Marvin Gaye, there is funding for that point in place surface replacement and repairs. Uh, okay. We are awaiting just warmer temperatures. You have to have consistent temperatures, I believe above 40 or 45 degrees for the installation of that surface. So we have I just spoke with DGS about this this morning about our expectation and that be done ahead of the spring season, right? Okay. When you have that high utilization. So that's that. Now, strategy for how we get these projects done. Um, we have proposed to DGS that we pool these projects, right? So meaning let's do uh, one procurement for multiple pour in place uh, surface replacements where you have one, maybe two contractors tops, and then we can get those done. All right. So that, okay. that, that's, I think that would be a more efficient and more productive approach to handling in a more immediate term. Now, strategically, how we approach this, we do facility condition assessments. Well, what I can tell you is this. Um, 
Marvin Gaye is a bit of an outlier. Typically, a porn play surface will last you 10 years. Like to give an example, uh, Council Member Gray is on. I remember when he was mayor, we cut the ribbon at the new Dakota Park playground and poured that surface in December of 2011. It was just replaced last year. It lasted almost 10 years like to the month, right? Before that right. was replaced. Marvin Gaye though, I think it was 2017, 2016. Well, we've done three replacements at Marvin Gaye oh, over, okay. that, over that same same span. So I, I definitely think that there, there are, and I don't want to skate, but there are some issues of, of vandalism and there are some other issues that we, we need to get a, a handle on. And I'm not saying that's the sole issue. I don't want to make it seem as if like vandalism is the root cause for that. Uh, but it's certain we want to look at. But these facility condition assessments are things that are done on a regular basis and then in forms. Like typically we have what is called a um, athletic field and playground kind of pooled budget. And yeah. then we also have like a playground repair budget. So we use those two in tandem. One we'll use for the PIP, that pour and play surface. The other one we will use to replace a side or a chain or things. So we use that. Right. And the facility conditions assessment Typically, they should last 10 years. In this case, it is not lasted. I, I can't give you a definitive answer as okay. to why, but that is our strategic approach to it. Okay, so maybe we need to look at in terms of a different type of surface material. I don't know, but I would tell you because Marvin Gaye is not the only one who looks like this. Palisades looks mm. like this too. Um, yeah. The only reason I know this is because now I have a real active toddler and you know we were hitting splash parks. So I mm. see playgrounds across the city. Mm. Um, and so I, that's just a question that I have. I, I'll leave that there because I only have three minutes left. Um, I want to ask about your relationship with DPW in terms of trash pickup. Mm -hmm. So of course, with the pandemic, we've had more people who've been out using your facilities, et cetera. And I can get like, there's so many times I get ping for requests for people who are upset that the trash cans are full at the rec center or at the playground. And then DPW is saying, oh, well, we were there on Tuesday. And it's like, okay, well, perhaps one day a week is no longer enough given the yeah. type of use. And, and so I'm curious, what is the relationship like there in terms of uh, recalibrating the schedule to ensure that we don't have trash piling up at your facilities? We've, I, 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 we've partnered with, we, we've had conversations with DPW on this and we, this was especially acute uh, during the, the, the early days of the pandemic, when we saw an explosion of usage of our outdoor facilities. Uh, and we, we know that they'll have to speak to, uh, I guess, um, the specific, their specific operations, but we have been successful at increasing the frequency at certain locations that, that warranted it. And, and I'll share with you, we have had DPR staff, you know, folks that that this is not in their job description to go out at times and, and collect and service these cans. Uh, so I hope to we can get back to pre pandemic levels of service right. uh, in, in the near future, because I, I do recognize that that's important. OK, OK, um, want to check in with you about uh, Texas Avenue Dog Park. Thank you for your response on the letter. Mm -hmm. um, have you all made any, um, you know, significant movement in terms of the um, uh, RFP? <laughs> sure, the, the uh, bids, the, the bidding period closed on December 23rd. Uh, those bids are under review. Okay. Uh, court, per DGS, we expect for a contractor to be selected and for us to be able to start that like design and that engagement process over the next six months. Uh, and a tentative schedule is for construction uh, to begin in uh, September and fit to be completed by the end of November. Uh, so that, that's the timeline as has been communicated and we're gonna work really hard to ensure that we stick to that. Okay, great. Um, and then finally, summer camp time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm on a mommy and me list and they already sent it out letting people know like put put the reminder on your <laughs> on your calendar that March 22nd get to it so obviously every year we have extremely high demand how are we can we get rid of the wait list do we need more <laughs> providers tell me what you need so I can get some of these parents you know slots for their young people well, I, I'm excited to share that we uh, will not only go back to pre-pandemic levels of slots, right? Hey. We, we also, through the investments of the federal funding and our boost camps and our partnerships with our schools, uh, I think that we'll go above 10,000 camp slots this year. Uh, I committed this number to the mayor that we would exceed 10,000 for the first time, I believe, ever. Uh, right. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, for comparison purposes, last year, we served about 53 to 5,600 kids. 
pre-pandemic, we would average around 7,500 to 8,000 slots. Uh, I think this year, uh, 10,000 is our goal for the number of slots, and we have a stretch goal uh, of maybe even getting to 11 to 12,000. So I do think that that'll include access, but also we're thinking about different ways to serve families. What, this is what I know as a parent. In addition just to traditional camps, as parents, we, we're looking to curate like a summer for our kids of activities, right? Yes. For, for experiences. <laughs> exactly, their experiences. And we know that that also entails athletics. We know that that entails uh, sometimes cultural arts. So this funding will allow us to be more creative. There is uh, something that I've been passionate about that we will have an opportunity to do for the first time. And that's tween camps, right? So tween, you, you know what a tween is, those 11 and 12 year olds that are kind of in the no man land, because our sweet spot has been and will always be the three to nine year olds. That's our sweet spot. And we know DOES through MBSYEP, I'm an alum, they pick up at 14. Uh, we know for those 10, 11, 12 year olds that uh, they, they're in need of some engagement. Uh, and these tween camps, well, we're gonna launch camps focusing on issues like esports and coding and, and broadcast journalism. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to launching that this summer. So we're gonna continue to be creative. And last but not least, learn to swim. That's another. A signature initiative that there always is a robust demand for in the spring and summer mm -hmm. through the federal funding that we receive, we'll be able to increase those slots. So we want to be able to meet the demand or more of the demand for people that want a full day option. But for those, again, I'm a parent of a six and a four year old. I know what it means to try to curate a summer and we want to be a part of that, uh, that those offerings and that solution. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman White. Thank you. Uh, we hear from our Ward 7, Councilman Vincent Gray. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> um, uh, Director Hunter, uh, I want to call your attention to a couple of things that we've talked about uh, along the way. Um, some of them you, you probably addressed a little bit. If you want to just you know talk succinctly about them, be my guest and do that. Um, the Challenges in Ward 7, and you heard one of those addressed today about uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, the Marvin Gaye um, uh, playground uh, facility. Um, what, what are the principal challenges, uh, Director Hunter, that you have, uh, you, you're facing in Ward 7 at this point? And if you want to be succinct about that, be, be my guest. Well, I think there are a lot of successes in Ward 7 uh, from Woody Ward uh, and the yes. robust nature of the programming there. We're doing some really cool things at Marvin Gaye that I'm proud of. Uh, launched a, uh, a, a fully registered and subscribed piano class there to add an element of cultural arts. We have Fit DC activations at Fort Davis, at Woody Ward, uh, and at Marvin Gaye. So that, there's a lot of good to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we, we spoke about the, the PIP issues at the, the, the poor and place surface issues at Marvin Gaye that I hope you can rectify soon. Uh, so of course there, there are challenges, but there's also a lot to celebrate. Of course, absolutely. And um, one thing that I'm especially uh, interested in at this stage, and you and I have talked about it on, on more than one occasion, and that is the uh, issues involving the uh, Jackie Robinson uh, baseball field, which you know is adjacent to the, the uh, the uh, baseball field that we did, we built uh, for with, with the Washington Nationals to create a baseball field for uh, young people uh, for the in the entire area, um, and uh, it's serving uh, it's serving young people uh, across the uh, national capital area. Um, can you can you tell me about the the, the project that we we've got some money from. We worked with, uh, with the chairman, we worked with, uh, worked with the mayor, we worked with uh, others uh, as well uh, to be able to, to return the uh, Jackie Robinson field uh, to its previous uh, level of uh, operation. As you know, it's right next to the, uh, right next to the, the, the baseball field uh, itself. Can you tell me what the status is uh, of the contract for that to be done, that to be let? Um, has it has this contract been selected as yet? And if so, can you tell me what the timeline is uh, for that? Uh, sure. Thanks again for your partnership. We're big fans of Jackie Robinson. Uh, there is $2.3 million allocated in this fiscal year, and mm -hmm. that work is slated to begin on uh, October, excuse me, uh, August 1st. 
and be completed by the end of the year. And the scope will include new fencing, lighting, scoreboards, bleachers, uh, to really bring that that field up to uh, a, a standard that is acceptable uh, and willing to work with your office and DGS to ensure that we stick to this timeline uh, and that this project does not slide. I really think that is the best time for it once they wrap up this spring sports uh, and then we'll get in there between fall and the dead of winter. So by this time next year, they have a brand new facility heading into spring and summer, which are their most programmed months for that organization. Okay, we, we've, had, we've, had so many, we've had so many parents um, who have approached us about, uh, about this issue. They, they are really enthusiastic about sure. getting the work done uh, there to, to make it uh, much more accessible, more available uh, to our young people uh, in that area uh, of Ward 7. So if, if, if it begins, you said it'll begin around August 1st, is that what you said? Correct. Okay. And what do you think the timeline is for being able to get that done? At the end of the year. So the, the, the given the nature of that project, we're, we're confident that we can complete that between, that, that should be completed uh, barring any unforeseen issues between August and uh, uh, August and the end of December. Okay. So because we're, we're maintaining the existing footprint, right? We're maintaining the existing footprint with, with, yeah. with upgrades to the lighting, fencing, uh, field repairs, irrigation, a few bleachers. Uh, it, it isn't major construction. So it's our hope that, uh, you know, a contractor that has the capabilities uh, should be able to go. And if they know what they're doing, they should be able to get in there and, and complete that within that time frame. Okay. So you think it, it's safe to, to tell the parents who are, who are asking these questions that by the end of the year, this project will be finished? Yes, uh, yes, I, I think that is appropriate. Uh, and Deputy Faulkner, if you wanna discuss, uh, if you wanna share any more details, if there's anything that I'm missing about th this project, cause I'm, I'm really excited about this. So I wanna make sure we're as thorough as possible. It is a very exciting project. Uh, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I just think the word of Keith- Very, very enthusiastic about getting it done. Yeah, I just think the word of Keith and the work that he's doing and guys like Andre Lee, you know, for me, this is personal, it's a matter of equity. Uh, I played in DPR's baseball league. I know what it is to play on a, on a, on a, on a field that's similar to gravel. Uh, and I want our kids to have a better experience than I had growing up in, in these facilities in the 90s. Absolutely, absolutely. Did Director Faulkner want to add to this? Um, good to see you, Councilmember Gray. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, so as a director, as a director stated, we are working with DGS actively to hire a design build uh, firm. So we will start designing that um, facility um, now. We're actually working on the scope of work, uh, which will include the new fencing, new lighting, school boards, bleachers, you name it, the whole nine yards. We're going to get it for Jackie Robinson. And we do anticipate that the construction will begin uh, August and will be completed by the end of the year. So very excited for that. And thank you for your uh, commitment to getting this project done with us. Yeah, we, we're very excited about getting this done. And there, there are so many parents who are enthusiastic themselves about this. Parents who serve on the, the advisory board uh, over there now who have approached me about, well, when is it gonna start? And I said, well, let me ask, let me ask uh, the director and his staff uh, at the uh, upcoming uh, hearing that we have. Uh, and so I think, that, I think that answers the question that I can tell them that uh, by, by, by August and by the end of the year, uh, we will have um, this done, right? That's right, that's right. And uh, yeah, we'll partner with you to, in DGS to make sure that, that this, this, this timeline goes forth uh, with, with what we've committed to. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I'm really enthusiastic. I think you know this. I'm really enthusiastic about the uh, Joy Evans uh, Therapeutic uh, Recreation Center, uh, which of course is right in uh, the heart of uh, Ward 7. Um, the, um, uh, my, my desire is to have uh, photos. Uh, we, we've been working with the family. I think you know that, uh, Director working with uh, the family of Joy Evans, uh, her sister. Uh, she's been actively involved and uh, we've been working with them to uh, also generate photos uh, that will be available uh, of the family. 
that can be included in the um, you know in the uh, you know in in the new in the new center when it's done. Um, is is there is there a, a contractor that's been selected uh, already uh, to get this done? We are in a uh, we are secure, smooth construction. We'll be responsible for the construction. So yes, uh, we have a contractor in place. Uh, we should have our permits uh, and. Uh, we're, we're confident that we will hold our last community meeting, that pre-construction meeting, to mostly okay. discuss the logistics of construction in March, and then the demo will begin and construction will begin this spring. So really, really excited about that. Uh, we closed that center after our summer operations to decommission it and to turn off the various utilities. Uh, we have the necessary approvals from the Fine Arts Commission. Uh, as you know, a portion of this land is still federal. Some is district mm -hmm. controlled and some is in, under the purview of MPS. Uh, so we, we work with them to ensure that everybody's on the same page with the scope of it, uh, made some scope changes uh, where appropriate uh, to meet the various approvals. And this project is full steam ahead. I can't wait for uh, that demo this spring. It's, go it's going to be a fantastic, I mean, it's just really fantastic. That's uh, Anyway, my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> will, will, we have, will we have a chance to come back quickly for another round? It won't, won't take me long. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to move to a committee member also. Uh, Council member Brianna Doe. She's still... Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, Director, thank you for your testimony today and all the work you're doing. I truly appreciate it. Um, I think I've told you before, as a parent of two kids under five, I experience a lot of the district through the parks and rec spaces. Um, and it makes me really proud that we have so many beautiful open spaces available to the public for free. Um, could I get an update on a few projects? Um, one, um, when we anticipate construction to be complete at the 19th and Lamont Park. Um, to, well, let's start with that. I need to check the specifics uh, of that project, but uh, my, my, my notes to give you a definitive date, but we do expect for that work to be complete by late summer. Uh, Deputy Falkland, can, can you chime in there? That is a correct director. So it will be completed uh, by late summer of this year. Can we do a ribbon cutting? Why not? Let's do it. <laughs> All right, good. That one was really community driven and I wanna make sure everybody gets to feel great about it. So absolutely, um, it's very exciting. Thank you for that. Uh, I had put $300,000 in the FY21 budget for a small park improvement, small park improvements in Ward 1 um, but we haven't seen the project initiated yet. Um, can we get movement on this? Um, we've been told that the triangle at 14th Oak and Ogden is the primary um, site being considered, which we totally support, but I just wanna make sure we get that started ASAP. Sure, yes, this project is going through the uh, early stages uh, of design uh, and we uh, might be a good time to have a, a community meeting about that. Uh, there, there is progress uh, and um, We'll uh, get that scheduled to get the feedback. We will make sure we follow up on that. Mm -hmm. What steps can we anticipate for the renovation of the Parkview Recreation Center and FY23? What's the engagement process? We haven't really gone through this since I took office. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Commissioner Bose, I believe, has been quite uh, active uh, and just a, a great partner as well as your yeah. office in that, in that Parkview community. Uh, that uh, I need to see, I believe the funding to, to, to your point is scheduled for FY23. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it'll be great to really hit the ground running and get a contract on board in, in, in the first quarter of FY23, which is you know just seven, eight months away. Uh, and then to start that process, we know our community engagement tends to take uh, before, we're, you know, and that process sometimes can take a year to 18 months or so. Yeah. So we haven't really gotten consistent answers on the scope of that project. Um, and there is really a desire, and I, I'm sure the commissioners raised this with you too, to move the building where, where it is on site to connect with the historic structure, which would create a more efficient use of space. 
Um, but I think DPR has said from time to time that it's only going to be an interior renovation. Um, can you clarify what our options are with this? Uh, sure. Deputy Faulkner, can you speak to what we can accomplish with this project? Sure, Director. Hi, Council Member. Um, so specifically with the Parkview project, uh, the intent of the funds is to actually modernize the entire facility, as well as some, uh, to make some improvements to the exterior space as well. As you know, there is the pool and some other structures on the site. So it is actually gonna be a full modernization, not just interior. Um, and of course the scope will be a collaborative effort with the community, uh, with uh, your office as well, as well as the other commissioners as well. So it's gonna be a collaborative approach. Um, there will be reconfiguration of the space. Of, uh, obviously with the building itself, we have to determine if the building structure itself is uh, stable enough for its construction. So uh, again, all of that's gonna be decided when we actually do the assessment of that facility and we work with the architects to determine what can actually be done in that space. As you know, we do have a limited space because of the field and the playground. So we're technically just working with the existing footprint of that building. Okay. Um... That's helpful to know. I mean, is it, since it is a full modernization, is there any opportunity to reconfigure where things are located in the square? You know, we could still keep the field, but move the building to another place. Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so, with the um, exception of the historic building, there is one that has right. an historic designation, um, which right. I know everyone loves. Uh, that so field house is great. We love that house. Yeah. Um, Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we would not want, want to run afoul of historic <laughs> preservation, um, but um, that's really encouraging. And I think one of the things the community has been trying to figure out is, does the amount that's in the budget fulfill all of our hopes and dreams? And it would be helpful to know, and I think we've talked about this with prior directors, but maybe we haven't quite nailed it down, is could we get um, some maybe uh, comps on how much money, how far this amount of money has gone on other sites if, to follow sure. up, that'd be great. And then yes. um, mm -hmm. one thing we'd love to know as we're going through this process is whether we could support a multi-story building on this site um, the way we have say at Columbia Heights Recreation Center. Well, you know, our policy is to design to the budget. Uh, and once we're able to uh, get that design firm on board, I think we'll have a, a better idea of how much ground we can cover. I got you. Okay. Um, we have $100,000 for Hargrove Park and Adams Morgan for improvements. Um, and hopefully that can be implemented in tandem with the funds we approved to repair Unity Park down the road. Do we know when this work is going to be going on? So specifically with Unity Park, um, yes, thank you for that. Um, we are actually actively working on uh, getting that resurface done with DGS. Um, and we can follow up with your office on a specific timeline of, of as, as to when that will be completed. What about Hargrove Park? Um, that I'll actually have to check on with uh, DGS as well. Okay. Um, and I believe, yeah. uh, Councilmember, I just want to ask, I believe that's a, um, I'm checking my notes, but that, that also at Hargrove is a resurfacing project. I think and also some of the, it's yeah. not, a, there's no, there's no playground equipment or anything. There are historic okay. benches and some other stuff. Yeah. And we'll, shrubbery and things like that. Yeah. Good okay. memory. Um, and then with Unity, just a note, we're trying to get a different sturdier um, uh, substance down there. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm looking at my clock. Um, just, uh, let's see, grateful for the expanded hours at some of our pools that you've been talking about. Thanks for that. Um, can you help us also um, shake loose the application for the um, official recognition of the 11th and Park Road um, Dog Park Friends of group? It just seems to be stuck in limbo. Sure. Uh, as you know, that, that property at, at this time is not district owned. So DGS is still in negotiations with WMATA. Uh, okay. and, and, and it's our positions that well, once it's in our inventory, then that'll be kind of like the first domino to fall for all of the other considerations. Hey, um, thank you very much. I want to stay on my time. So I appreciate your testimony and all your work today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, now to our Ward 2 colleague, 
Councilmember Brooke Pinto. Thank you so much, Chairman White. And Director Hunter, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for all of your continued work. Um, I want to start with trash cans. I know that Councilmember Henderson started to ask you a little bit about this, but who is responsible for collecting trash at DPR properties? The, th those cans, if you're specifically re referring to those cans, they, they are serviced by, by DPW. Okay, and that's across all DPR properties. That, that is, that is. So the, the, the rule of thumb, if it's on the ground, DGS is responsible for picking it up off the ground. If it's in a can, then DPW is responsible for servicing those cans. Okay, and I imagine DPR gets a lot of requests from residents around trash because we often get a lot of requests from residents about trash about DPR. So what is your process to relay those requests to DPW? Well, we work closely with their executive team uh, on these issues. And on occasion, we have had to increase frequency uh, of collections at sites. Uh, and uh, their communication with us is that they are committed to returning to those pre-pandemic levels of service, uh, hopefully in the near future. Now, what we've done as a stopgap measure, uh, we have, uh, I shared earlier, we, we've had DPR staff. It's not in the inventory. They do other things uh, that sometimes I've volunteered to pick up additional shifts. They may be program managers and, and leads. And, and uh, we even had architects and permits folks that have went out and, and assisted with this just because we realize it's, uh, it's so acute in certain communities. So my hope is that we'll continue to do that, like put out the fires as they arise. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll rely heavily on DPW uh, to, to do this work and, um, you know, uh, going forward. That, that's the most sustainable way to make sure that this is addressed. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to ask about a couple of particular uh, Ward 2 sites. So the new Banneker campus in Shaw Park um, is really exciting for the opening, but their entrance is still closed to the Banneker track and field on R and 10th Street. Um, when we've asked in the past, we were told that there were some security concerns about opening that entrance, but the entrances are still open on the side for the public to enter. enter. So do you know why that front entrance is still closed. Uh, Deputy, can you speak to the specifics of Banneker? Um, Director and uh, Council Member, good to see you. Um, I am not aware of these issues, but we will reach out to DCPS and uh, determine what, how, how we can provide that access. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and it is a shared space. As you know, we 100% we operate the skate dog uh, but we'll we'll reach out to DCPS on, on, on that shared space access. Okay, thank you very much. And speaking of, there are so many members of the public and community who have been enjoying those shared spaces, and I think it could really benefit from a bathroom. Uh, why were bathrooms not initially installed at Shaw Skate Park? We had heard that DPR paid for a building with a mechanical room, and so is it possible to include a bathroom in that same space? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, th this is a citywide issue, uh, bathroom access, and we participate on a, a task force that is, that is designed at, at looking at this. Uh, and Deputy Faulkner can speak to uh, the goals of that, that task force. I can tell you it's reflected, and it will be bathroom access is reflected in our master plan. Uh, and there are some innovations. The cities start to address this. In fact, uh, Oxen Run is slated to get the district's first uh, Portland Loo, which is a um, more of a, a flexible like bathroom, not, not the old school brick structures that are like mini bunkers, uh, but a, a little less expensive to construct that we think can be a model uh, for locations uh, like Sean Banneker that are highly populated with, uh, with with traffic and the use of those amenities. Uh, Deputy, can you speak to this task force and, and, and how we hope to address this more strategically? Yeah, thanks, Director. So uh, actually last year, uh, DPR, along with um, uh, district agencies, uh, were added to a public restrooms facilities uh, working group 
And this group is responsible for identifying uh, locations and recommendations around providing public restrooms and public spaces. And so uh, this, this working group has actively provided a, um, a draft recommendation that is going through the approval process right now and uh, with some identified sites. And um, it, it's, it's uh, looking at um, citywide issue that we know that has been perpetuated since the pandemic. And so this um, um, identification of priority sites are gonna be coming out soon. So hopefully uh, we will know more in the next coming uh, weeks. Okay, and you may not know the answer to this now if they're still circulating the recommendations, but what types of metrics go into making the determination of which site is appropriate for a public restaurant? I'm sorry, Council Member, your, your audio was a little low. Can you, can you repeat that question? Oh, sorry, can you hear me more clearly? Is this any better? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. Let's say what metrics go into that decision of which site is appropriate for a public restroom or a good yeah. candidate, I should say. Well, really easy one if there are any actual facilities nearby. So, um, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of Banneker and the school, uh, but maybe there's a way for us to factor in some sort of restroom access. I, I don't know the configuration of that school and some of the operational challenges, uh, but that's one of the things we look at. Uh, I believe. Councilmember Lewis George, we talked about the difference between like at an Emory where you you have to go into the building to use the restroom versus like a Tacoma uh, and a Petworth where you can access it from the outside. As we develop more and more buildings, that is a part of, or we build more and more buildings, that, that will be a part of our specs going forward because we recognize just how, uh, just how crucial it is to have bathroom access. Okay. Thank you so much. We definitely agree. Um, I need to see, hope to see more uh, bathrooms installed at these, these places. Absolutely. Um, I have a number of project specific questions, uh, and I know I'm about to be out of time, so I'll come back next round um, if that is all right. But thank you again. Thank you, Chairman White. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Hunter. Um, in the agency responses, a uh, smart C system is used to track the performance metrics for roving leaders and external affairs teams, project management, and staff schedules within the community engagement division. What outcomes have you learned from uh, the performance metrics with that system? Uh, well, it, of course, it, it sort of varies. Uh, what, what I can share with you is that uh, one of the things that we look closely at, like specifically as it relates to our role in leaders division, uh, there, there's extensive research. Um, uh, one that we sort of hold as our North Star is one from the Centers for Disease Control that talks about how uh, in preventing youth violence, uh, youth that are engaged with uh, positive uh, adults, youth that are engaged in controlled in environments such as our recreation centers have much better outcomes than those that are, are disengaged and disconnected to services. Uh, so that's something that we closely look at. Um, when we're evaluating the performance of our roving leaders division, uh, what, what, I, what I look at is a mix of the programming that they provide uh, and also the relationships and the, that they have with other entities like the school system. Like so many of our recreators, and you notice you were roving leaders, they, they wear dual hats. Like our, uh, uh, you know, uh, Coach Rob, right? Rob Nickens. Not only is he in that building at Roosevelt, uh, he's also doing Safe Passage. Um, uh, Roving leader Al. Not only is he in that building at Turkey Thicket, I mean, coaching six or seven teams by himself. Um, he's also at Brooklyn providing safe passage and, um, you know, working closely with the principal and that administrative staff. So that, that's just like the, the context behind what we do. We're always looking to take that two prong approach where they are, um, they're doing programs or they're doing mobile activations, but also where we have relationships with other entities that we can assist with some of their most pressing challenges. Thank you. In the aquatics program expansion, uh, talked about in FY20, um, there was a huge demand for aquatic fitness programs such as hydro spin, aqua pool, aqua board uh, at facilities. Uh, these were slated to come online. I know we're still in the COVID-19 pandemic, but has this expansion occurred? Sure, uh, no, it, not to the extent that we would have liked, uh, specifically as it relates to, to, to hydro spin. And I, I will say 
that that is i don't you know like to overuse covid as an you know uh, uh as a as an excuse but that that one is the casualty of covid meaning that like those classes uh, keep in mind just only until um, you know October 2021, we were still doing lap lanes and lap reservations. So that that programming is coming back as we get into like successive quarters. Uh, so that's something that we'll pick up steam on this uh, this fall. Now, other programming that there is a high demand for things like learn to swim. Uh, and some of the federal funding that we've received will allow us to increase our learn to swim offerings this spring, summer, and into this fall. Thank you. There's been extended conversation over the years about uh, local organizations or schools or community having access to recreation facility and amenities. Um, and there's been a battle between those who may have uh, acquired the space through online or paying or through contract. How has DPR been able to prioritize to ensure that uh, residents who live in the community or students are able to access those uh, activities during peak hours? Sure. We, we have a 2014 regulation approved by council uh, that governs our priority of use. Uh, and uh, I'll ask my staff to, my colleagues rather, to uh, populate that in the chat for, for those that are uh, attending to be able to, to view that. Uh, but it's a ranking order and it talks about uh, DPR programs are, are first. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we partner with uh, public and charter schools to, to meet their needs. Then third, uh, community-based organizations that serve youth and then so on and so forth. Uh, but what we like to do is really try to focus on collaboration, right? It, it, it's tough to give folks 100% sometimes of, of what they desire, but we try to meet them halfway. So I, I'll give you an example. Uh, in FY19, pre-pandemic, our highest year on record with regard to the number of permits issued, we were around like 46 or 47,000. In FY19, in FY21 alone, and this is even with the restrictions, we issued almost 78,000 permits. So 48,000 to 78,000 for not even a full year. Uh, so far, just through one quarter, we've already issued 28,000 permits. So we're on course, we're on pace to issue over 100,000 permits and, and 100,000 permits. And the way that we're doing that is we're, we're, we're splitting fields, we're splitting gyms, um, we're, we're asking teams to be flexible with sometimes or, or organizations to be flexible with the, the, the site of the locations that they use. So, um, you know, we, we, we do the best we can with the finite number of fields and resources. Uh, but I'm really proud of the work that we have done to, to meet that ever-growing demand. And the landscape is totally different from pre-COVID to now. New organizations have sprouted up and popped up, uh, offshoots of other organizations. Uh, so it, it's a very competitive landscape and I'm proud of the work that we're doing to meet that demand. Thank you. So I, I put in a budget to uh, redo some aspects of Auction Run Park, including the Living Road, Livingston Road, basketball court and we discussed that supposed to happen hasn't happened yet uh uh fitness uh outdoor fitness uh retrofitted for that space where are we with that and because we we we, we, we that's what happened in the summertime it's january so trying to get an update on yeah that. yeah i'll be honest with you i'm just really disappointed that that project hasn't been completed uh and we'll uh, more than willing to work with your office and dgs to see how we get that back on track have you heard what the holdup is at all? I have not. Okay. Um, also, we've been uh, having extensive conversations about the recreation centers. Do you see any holdup in the uh, Congress Heights rec and also the Anacostia rec? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, Anacostia is coming along really, really well. Uh, Anacostia at Ketchum. Uh, we're making good progress. The community has been highly engaged. We have a consensus on a the design. So that, that project is, is running its course. Now, Congress Heights, I, I will caution uh, that um, it, it will require a, a redesign. You know, uh, as you know, we were um, uh, at, at your request and, and through your uh, work, uh, additional $13 million was done to be able to increase that scope uh, so we got to go back and have that project redesigned from the standpoint of incorporating those those elements, right? The pool, so we can uh, have the architectural drawings and renderings to be able to secure a, a contractor to complete that work. So that will take some time, uh, but uh, we we are 
are scheduled to proceed with that project. Thank you. And we're trying to expedite that design as well. I, I just want to say that. I, I know yeah. it's been a long time coming. I don't know what, the, I'm not a, I'm not an architect, but it's been months. Um, it's about to be budget time again. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where are we with that? Because the residents are anticipating that for quite some time now. Um, fast forward, uh, the committee has received several concerns about DPR uh, parks not being identified with signs. I'm not sure if you heard this as well. For example, Pope Branch Park was destroyed by termites and not replaced. Lockridge Park needs directional signage. Uh, the residents have expressed confusion between the national park areas and DPR and where DGS has responsibility for several service in these areas. Um, can you provide a committee with a list of DPR uh, can, parks that have signage issues and a plan to uh, address these signage issues? We're going to undertake uh, a signage strategy this uh, spring and into summer. Um, it's also an issue at dog parks on uh, um, informing residents of uh, the various leash laws and no dogs on athletic fields. Uh, it, it's an issue to your point, the increase in wayfinding signage, uh, hours of operations. And we last revisited this some years ago. So now it's time to uh, revisit that and come up with a strategy to have uh, more adequate signage. And uh, that's something we're committed to in this fiscal year to doing. Uh, Ready to Play has been a good vehicle to sort of uh, be uh, a repository for those sort of strategic initiatives. Uh, and it, it's my commitment that uh, we'll, we'll complete that assessment. I think we're looking at over 500 uh, uh, DPR like properties and park sites for this. So uh, it, it is a major undertaking, but my hope is to have that completed uh, this fiscal year. Thank you, I'm over my time. So I'll jump back to council member uh, Christina Henderson. Uh, thank you, council member White. Um, Councilmember Lewis George asked me to ask a question about Roosevelt. Um, director, so hold on, let me pull sure. up our question real quick. Um, so Roosevelt Pool, I also live in Ward 4, so I kind of have a, you know, an interest here. Um, are you fully staffed up in August? We funded seven full-time lifeguards to make the facility open to the public. Sure. So we, we, we're hiring for those positions now. Now it's open because we've absorbed the operations within our existing staffing levels, okay. uh, but we are hiring those actual positions uh, now, right, to backfill those uh, uh, positions. So right now it's open because we've absorbed those operations, but uh, I, I appreciate it. And we're hiring for the new ones now. Okay. I'm curious, just across the agency, how many vacancies do you currently have? We, we currently have about 100 vacancies. Okay. Are you finding applicants to be able to fill these positions? So I had a conversation earlier this morning with Office of Unified Communications and they're struggling over there. So I'm curious, is this something that we're seeing district government wide in terms of our ability to recruit and retain staff? Um, you know, at the top of my testimony, I acknowledge uh, almost, uh, you know, 10 DPR employees that have passed away. We've had a number of retirements. Uh, we do have an older workforce. Uh, we have had a number of retirements in recent years. I think that that's sort of related to the the uh, uh, coronavirus. So I, I will say that it it is an issue. I, I would it wouldn't be accurate if I um, said that it wasn't. We do have a committed base of employees uh, to weather this storm. We have extended almost 100 of our seasonal employees uh, wow. just to weather this storm. If it wasn't for that, when Omicron. Uh, uh, we, we didn't close down many of our sites. Uh, we, uh, you know, had to shut our select programs that we had like an outbreak, like one of our uh, uh, cheer programs, we had an outbreak. So it was appropriate to cancel that. But we were able to weather the storm uh, because of the commitment of our colleagues and because of our seasonal employees who are, I'm grateful for uh, carrying this burden. So it's it's uh, carrying this load rather. Uh, so uh, my hope is that once we're beyond this, we can get back to pre-pandemic levels of staffing. Okay. Um, in terms of Roosevelt Pool, is there plans to um, have this pool open on the weekends or over the summer? Uh, the, she says, the, or she goes further to say, how about just Saturdays? That, well, i tell you what, <laughs> we can, uh, I, I can't commit the weekends at this time, but I can commit to the summer at this time. Okay, uh, okay. 
And I will say this, we do take a reasonable approach because, you know, Upshur is just a hop, skip and a jump away from Roosevelt. And I think Upshur is consistently in our top two or three highest utilized pools during the summer. Yep. So we'll ensure that ours are complimentary. Uh, and okay. Upshur pool tends to be open on weekends, including Sunday. Yep. Um, is the Dunbar Aquatic Center also a DCPS owned pool? It is, but it's one that we uh, operate on their behalf and we do offer public hours at Dunbar as well as H.D. Woodson and Roosevelt. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Lewis George noted that in pre-hearing responses, um, they had Saturday attendance numbers that would seem to indicate that it was open on Saturdays as well. So she would just like to see some equity amongst. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, I can tell you it is not, it is a Monday through Friday now. Uh, it, okay. it is, yeah, it is Monday through Friday. We wanted to standardize our, our hours for, um, for, for DPR, for DCPS locations to coincide when we have the highest usage. Um, we like to take a regional approach yep. uh, to this so that there is access within a reasonable distance. Okay. Um, I want to ask about the uh, the therapeutic pool uh, mm -hmm. in Ward Seven. So I, I've learned a lot, you know, from yeah. the seniors about temperatures and where they need to be and mm -hmm. the whole nine. And um, I know that you were talking to Councilman McGray in terms of the plans mm -hmm. for that. One of the things that has been raised is that um, in in they're grateful for what is coming, but in the interim time, is there a um, What's the word? Is there a temporary solution that we can provide to, uh, you know, perhaps up the temperature at an indoor pool to uh, make it usable <laughs> for our seniors no, I, for their uh, aerobic activity? No, I, absolutely. Uh, I, I understand that concern. What is attractive about a therapeutic pool is not just the programming, it's the temperatures. Right. Yeah. So what we've done, we've moved the programming to Berry Farm. We've moved the programming to Deanwood. So the, so the programming is still occurring. It's a temperature, though. Right. Exactly. But and, and unfortunately, it, it's, it's not like as easy as like like a thermostat in your home. Hey, I'm a little chilly. Let's you know crank this thing up to maybe 78 degrees. <laughs> uh, it, it, it isn't as easy with our pools. Right. Uh, our aquatic professionals, folks that, you know, decades of experience and, and conferring with maintenance folks, uh, the, the, those pools can't sustain those high temperatures. So it's, it's uh, I, trust me, I can't wait to the new TR center is open uh, and in our ready to play plan, we want to potentially construct more pools that have, can maintain those therapeutic temperatures. But uh, I, I can tell you with confidence that if we were to do that, it'd go well, maybe a month or two, three weeks tops, a month, I, I can guarantee you uh, within a short time, though, those systems would fail because they can't sustain those high temperatures. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on, uh, I guess, some conversation that happened earlier with uh, some of the public witnesses around um, the permitting for field use mm -hmm. and just some general conversation around that. Um, in, in your opinion, have we improved in terms of the level of transparency around the field permitting process? Well, you know, I think the numbers speak for themselves. FY19, 48,000 permits. Uh, FY21, nearly 78,000 permits. FY22 to date, just one quarter, 28,000 permits. So we're issuing more permits. Now, the truth of the matter is sometimes we can't give everyone every one that they want. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, this organization does great work. I know the executive director and uh, I consider us to be uh, associates. And I said, hey, man, come on now. You, you have the field. Um, you have the field five and a half days. I, I'm sorry I can't get you the sixth day. I, I'm sorry. I can't I can't do it. All right, and you know the truth of the matter is, is that we also hear from communities that they're interested in other programming. So we were launching soccer programs and Tiny Tots, which is growing. Soccer is one of our largest. We, we launched a kickball program this summer to engage our teens, and I'm so proud of uh, uh, the team from Sports Health and Fitness and launching that program. We have participants from King Greenleaf and Riggs LaSalle. So it's important that we balance the varying and diverse needs of our communities to provide our kids with exposure. Again. I grew up in rec and I'm appreciative of my experience, but I would have, you know, maybe tennis was my sport, you know, uh, if I would have been exposed to it, you know, maybe kickball, soccer ball, some other sport. So we want to provide some more exposure, essentially. Okay. Um, Council Member White, I'm over my time, but I just have one last question, if you don't mind, and then I'm done. Done, done, for real, for real. <laughs> 
Councilmember Gray, I don't see the head nods. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the roof at Riggs LaSalle. What's <laughs> the plan for that? Sure. Well, so we have adequate funding to replace the HVAC system in this fiscal year. Uh, and it's our hope that when they're up there replacing the HVAC, that they'll go ahead and they'll tackle the roofing issues. But is there enough money to do both? Well, we will bid that. I'm going to wait for our bids to, to come okay. back in. Okay. Uh, and we are doing an assessment, uh, but but the, where the rubber meets the road is where the um, when, when we do that that th those bids. So we want to okay. we want to do that work together. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Chairperson White. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. You gotta unmute yourself, Councilmember Gray. Your your screen is still muted. You can start. Is that better, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I want to I want to uh, go back to an, uh, an, an area that we were talking about earlier, uh, and that is uh, particularly we're talking about. We, we mentioned the uh, the ice arena and what the work that's being done on that. Can you can you give me an update, Mr. Director, on where we are with the uh, development of the new ice arena uh, at? Uh, very, very near to uh, the uh, to 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 the services that are being provided uh, right there in that area of uh, the city. Sure, uh, more uh, city. absolutely. Really excited about this project as well. Uh, the friends of the Fort Dupont Ice Arena they're scheduled to move out in February, so next month, uh, and demo is scheduled to begin in March. Uh, and we expect for this new facility to be completed by uh, late summer, early fall of two thousand and twenty-three. Okay, uh, you said 2023. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and that's give give me the uh, the operation the occupancy date as best you can at this point. Sure, uh, we've been communicated by, by DGSA a a, uh, a completion date of August seventh of 2023. Okay, all right. Um, by the way, and, uh, and, and there's a period, of course, there's a period before we can open for operations, but that's the you know, hopefully the, the hammers down <laughs> uh, date for construction to be able to, uh, you know, make the center ready for uh, public public use. Yeah, I, can, can you, as best you can at this stage, can you give me a date for when there will be occupancy uh, for the new ice arena at Fort DuPont? I, I would say fall 23, I, I would. So if the completion date is 8-7, typically just to let you know what happens during that period, what are moving in furniture? Uh, they're training staff on how to utilize the new technology, whether that's a uh, alarm system or uh, technology there. We are uh, moving in equipment, uh, sometimes hiring up. Uh, so if that center is completed on August 7th, I'm fully confident that uh, it'll be open within 30 to 45 days from that building being turned over to uh, the the agency and our partner, Friends of Fort DuPont. And what typically happens, even on 8-7, there's like a punch list. We go back in and say, hey, you missed this. Hey, take a look at this. This wasn't done. This. Move this a foot over. Move this over uh, there. So that, that, that's a process. Uh, so again, if, if it's completed in August of 2023, it'll be open that fall. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm also grateful for the conversations that we have had with you and uh, Deputy Mayor Kine um, about the uh, recreation center, uh, rec rec the Hillcrest Recreation Center. Uh, can you tell me what the status is uh, of that situation at this point? I mean, we've talked about the fact that um, Hillcrest uh, is, is, is not, not in good shape by any stretch and it has not been for a very long time. And we're, work, we're trying to work with the, uh, the folks who live in uh, the uh, Hillcrest area to try to um, create a much better recreation uh, service than what we have at this point. I mean, we, we have the recreation center uh, at Hillcrest, and then we have the uh, school, uh, which is nearby also, which we've had some conversation about. So can you give me some idea of what's going to happen with the uh, Hillcrest Recreation Center at this point? Uh, uh, sure. Um, it, there is some good 
happening at the site that I want to highlight. Uh, mm -hmm. We have an excellent partner that has a great cheer program there. There's great utilization of the outdoor amenities, the, the splash park, the play park. I, I'm there often. We have close friends that, that live nearby. Uh, so we're there during the summer. It's one of my favorite sort of uh, hidden gems that, that we like to utilize as a family. So there, there is some great things. Now, there is opportunity uh, uh, for improvement and to modernize that facility. It, it, is, it is due. Uh, currently, there is not budget that has been allocated for it, uh, but we're going to work with the executive on that. Uh, and we view Hillcrest as a part of DPR strategy to address some service gaps uh, in that community. Uh, what, what I can tell you is that uh, there is a need for uh, an aquatic center in that facility. Uh, the nearest would be Dinwood, which is certainly not walking distance, and even traversing it, it it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy uh, vehicular commute. And, and forget about it, trying to get there via public transportation, it's just not not there. So for strategic purposes, it makes a lot of sense, uh, and we'll continue to have those uh, those conversations. Uh, we met last in December. I am scheduled to, I believe, attend the Hillcrest Civic or Community Associations meeting the first Saturday uh, in February, and we'll, we'll keep the dialogue on going. All right. Well, um, I, I'll be asked along the way, uh, Director, uh, what what should I tell them at this stage, other than you coming to another meeting? What what what's mm -hmm. the what's the wrap that I can share with them at this point? We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it <laughs> well it, it, it isn't just the recreation center it's also the school that's over there as well and we of course are trying to work with deputy mayor kind uh on that as well have you had some further conversation with him about the school uh that's nearby the uh winston school we're working on it. No, I have. I have. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I have. And he uh, shares, uh, he understands that, I, I don't want to speak for the deputy mayor, but he understands uh, that whatever we decide to do uh, with that joint campus, and it really should be a, 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 a attached from a joint perspective that uh, we, we know we're going to have to consult the community. We know we're going to have to, whatever is done, it's going to have to fit in uh, in, in character with the wishes of the community and what that community can support. Uh, so it, it's a priority. It's on our radar and uh, we're, we're working on this. And I'm not just saying that. We, we, are, we are actually working on this. And I, I hope to have some updates. As soon as I know, we'll share with you in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Hunter. Um, it, it, it is a huge priority. There are so many people uh, in Hillcrest, as you know, uh, who care deeply about what's happening with the school, what's happening with the recreation center. And uh, I, I, I'll tell them that the next time you come, which is soon, uh, next month, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, that you will be able to share with them what the next step will be um, with, uh, with the recreation center and with the school. Is that Absolutely. a fair Absolutely. And I just want to add what, what we were able to accomplish for Woody Ward, you know, over on yeah. the uh, Southern yeah. Avenue. I think that is a model for a center that uh, was not utilized or programmed to its potential because of the dilapidated conditions. I mean, that, that whole campus now we've experienced an explosion just in programming and activities. We're fielding basketball teams for the first time in five or six years since uh, Eben Island was coaching. Uh, we had a boxing program that is having some success. In fact, we sent a uh, the young lady's name escaped me with a female boxer to our national to the national tournament in uh, Louisiana in Shreveport, Louisiana. So there's uh, just great success and a lot that we can build upon at Woody Ward, and we hope to bring that magic to the Hillcrest community. Okay, well that that that's that's great news. I'm going to be able to share that with the folks in Hillcrest about what was done with with uh, Woody Ward. It's going to be done hopefully with uh, with the uh, Hillcrest. Recreation Center and the uh, Winston School that's over there as well. I was yeah. going to tell the chairman that I was yeah. going to be able to give him back a few minutes, but I, I think I've already, I, I think I've exhausted those, those minutes I was going to give back. So thank you, Director Hunter. I appreciate it and we'll look forward to seeing you when the, when the budget comes through, through. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Director. Um, or you know, how much we can get through. Are you aware of the drainage issues on Stead Park Field? Um, this has been more readily coming to our attention and wondering if this is gonna be addressed during the larger park renovation. 
We, we, we do. We do. Uh, and I'm excited about Stead Park. And I want to thank the, the friends of Stead Park. They have been a dynamic partner uh, it, with their uh, contributions towards the design, uh, uh, helping us through that process or in close collaboration to have a design approved by the um, the Fine Arts Commission. Uh, and we recognize that uh, that turf field needs to be replaced. Uh, but also the community wants it open during the construction. So we want to sequence it, whereas though we are able to construct the facility uh, and we'll keep the field online during the construction, and then we will address the field afterwards, right? Because we don't want a new field with all of the construction, you know, and there'll be damage to the field. So um, that, that, that's our plan. Center first, field second, redo the field, address the drainage issues at that time. And that project is uh, scheduled to be completed by fall of 2023. So we're uh, making good progress on that and really excited about that. We have all the necessary approvals. So we are uh, uh, had to do some um, uh, design changes, but we're, we're in good shape there. Well, thank you very much for your work on that. I know so many neighbors, myself included, are really looking forward to it. Um, so it's my understanding that in previous years, there was funding put in the budget for improvements for Kennedy Rec Center, which now after redistricting is now moved from Ward 6 to Ward 2. Um, we don't think that DPR has created a scope of work or a timeline for that project. Um, have you been made aware of the need for improvements? Are there any plans to move forward on them or is there a still budgetary needs? Well, there's a million dollars, uh, and our work is scheduled to begin on April 1st, and our hope is that it will be completed on July 31st. Uh, what, what I can tell you is that um, that facility, uh, th there was heavy utilization of that facility, and during the, the, almost the first year of COVID, um, it's tough to say that, but yeah, gosh, the first year of COVID, it was a, uh, a shelter, uh, and the bathrooms are in amongst the worst conditions. So a million dollars won't go far, but what it will allow us to do is to expand that senior room, which is a desire of the community. It'll allow us to refresh the lighting, upgrade the lighting and the flooring, and to hopefully address those, those bathroom issues. So uh, that, that, that is the scope of work for that. And then that'll allow us at least to get back uh, to a, um, a basic level of, of, of programming. And also that, that scope includes kitchen upgrades and also gym flooring. Uh, so I'm excited about that. We, we just took control of that center uh, 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 from our, our, our partners and the uh, sheltering uh, uh, agencies uh, just at the end of the summer. Uh, it was scheduled to begin in November, which is why there's been a lag in programming, but now it's scheduled for April. And um, we're really driving home our point. It has to begin, it has to begin. Um, in the meantime, we have programmed that site with our roving leaders, with some special events. And we've had a number of young men from that seventh and O community uh, that, that testified. I don't know if you got a chance to hear them, but I think they're, they're a success story about what partnership and engagement can look like. Well, completely agree. Thank you so much. Um, and speaking of senior programming, how does DPR determine which locations receive senior programming and how much additional staff um, are needed to provide senior programming at each location? Well, we have certain classifications. So we have senior centers uh, and Fort uh, Stevens in Ward 4 is one of two senior centers. Theodore Hagen's Cultural Center is the other. Uh, that, that center is, that entire parcel is slated for um, renovation and redevelopment. So those are senior centers. Then we have senior programming uh, or senior programs, right? Where we have uh, while not the entire facility, seniors will have dedicated space. And Fort Stanton, um, the residents from Fort Stanton testified today. Uh, so we have over 20 of those throughout the um, uh, through, throughout our inventory uh, that are active. Um, because of COVID considerations, those have been the, uh, they, they're not back up to pre-COVID levels. We've done virtual programming. What we hear from them is that they, they always aren't necessarily comfortable with meeting in person at this point. Uh, so we have continued some virtual programs. We have done uh, various field trips through our senior division. So that, that's our approach. We look to heavily program centers. Then we look to have robust programs in various uh, centers that, that are active and have our full complement of programs. Okay. And do you know how many FTEs you need to support senior programming specifically at the Kennedy Rec Center? Uh, well, once the... Once the 
so I got some feedback. Uh, I, I don't, at this point, I, I can't identify an FTE need uh, specifically for Kennedy. What I can say is that it will be staff and there will be senior programming once the construction is complete, hopefully this summer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so last year during this oversight hearing, I asked whether DPR works with Aussie to prioritize spaces in DPR summer camp for at-risk students. And I understand that there is a prioritization in Ward 7 and 8 for kids experiencing homelessness and want to renew my ask that at-risk students in all wards are prioritized for summer camp. And I'll be speaking to Aussie about this too, but just wanted to put that on the radar. We have, and we have something in place. Uh, what, what I can share with you is that we heard from families. So we partnered with DHS for youth that are experiencing homelessness, but also with CFSA, uh, with foster families to ensure that they have access to the programming. And what we heard from both the agency and those parents was that they wanted more centrally located options. Uh, so we are uh, identifying space within DPR's inventory for centrally located hubs. So if you're a foster family, uh, let's say in Ward 4, you, you don't have to travel to, to Ward 8 for uh, a camp slot. Uh, and then also we're looking to increase slots throughout our inventory. So that's one approach. And then also um, through our boost camps, which are partnerships with uh, DCPS and charter schools, we'll be able to create additional slots uh, for vulnerable populations. Okay, thank you. And lastly, are all Ward 2 projects still on track? Uh, they are. They are. Can I answer any specific questions? You know, we're really excited about uh, Duke Ellington Field. We, we finished that first kind of phase of the geotech studies and the traffic studies uh, and um, looking forward to deeper engagement with the community and, and, and Jellif. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hit the ground running. We have that great feasibility study. Uh, I appreciated the uh, constituents testimony on that. They mentioned that uh, the, the, the plan had some good elements. We, we will still need to tweak it, but it's a base for us to begin our deeper community engagement on Jell-O. All right, love to hear it. Hopefully if there are any delays, we can keep open lines of communication. Sure. Uh, but hopefully that won't be the case. So thank you very much, Director Hunter. Thank you, Chairman right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director. Um, I wanna ask you a little bit about the union engagement. Um, are, are you guys recreation specialists, managers, unionized? Our recreation specialists are unionized. Our MSS employees are, are not a part of the union. How many grade 11 employees at DPR are in the union? Grade 11 uh, MSS or grade 11? Well, we, we created, I'm really proud of, uh, you know, upward mobility and professional growth is what everybody wants. Um, we created Recreation Specialist 11, which are career service positions. And while we, while we could have, it was under our discretion to have those be non-agency positions, we wanted career growth and we heard that people uh, wanted to maintain their union membership. Uh, so we were able to maintain that, um, that, that union status for them. And I believe uh, there, there are a number of 11s across the agency. Now we have MSS 11, which are site managers. Those are non-union. Okay. I guess we're looking forward to figuring out how we can uh, increase the growth. I think under your leadership, uh, we've increased the step ladder for a lot of employees in DPR, but I still, you know, I, I, I've seen it, you know, I previously worked in DPR, I went away to college, worked in the nonprofit field, came back, and there were a lot of individuals still at grades five and seven in DPR. Uh, some of those individuals moved up, and I think the salary was around 40,000. And you know, in Washington DC, it's hard to sustain a family and really grow under those uh, current salaries. And so some of those individuals moved up, I'm not sure how many, um, but I'm concerned that we can do more um, in this next budget cycle to give some mobility to some of those, especially long-standing, dedicated uh, employees there at DPR. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll just share this. Um, over 300, uh, I'll get that number for you, where we had a mass uh, promotion, what was called a, um, uh, after we had a, uh, I forget the name of the study, but there's an HR study where you like, where you like reclassify folks. Uh, so everyone from our rangers to our recreation specialists, uh, to uh, some of our audio techs and, and, and roving leaders, uh, they, they all received increases. Now, with that being said, that's not to say we got it all done in, in, in that try. Uh, and we're, we're continuously prioritizing positions, even more so 
the majority of our promotions are all internal. Very rarely, unless we, we feel like there's an expertise we don't have within the agency, we try to reserve most of our positions for internal growth opportunities. Thank you. Uh, there was about $2.7 million in various reprogramming and various sources. Uh, do you anticipate uh, similar reprogramming at FY22? Um, and was that funding restored? I would need to see the specifics of that, um, that, that 2.7. If it's capital, that, that's always typically a, a, um, a process. Uh, so I would, in fact, I'm looking at a list now. Yeah, I would need, I'll give you a more formal response. I want to make sure that I am, uh, uh, that I am, I'll uh, give you the most accurate information. So we'll, we'll give you a formal response on that. Thank you. And I think I, I saw on the employee spreadsheet, um, there are two chief of staff positions, uh, one with a grade 16 with a salary of 162, and one with a grade nine. Is there a reason to have two chief of staff positions? Yeah, we, 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 both. We would never fund both, right? We would never bring on, I don't think any agency has two chiefs of staff. And right now we, we don't have a chief of staff. That position is, is vacant. Uh, and um, we, uh, there are not any immediate plans to fill it. In fact, we prioritize the, the hiring of lifeguards and a couple of other positions that are, that are crucial. Uh, so I, I would say that if you notice the, there's one was like at a grade nine, that, that's just a, a technical correction that needs to be made. We would never hire two. Uh, and uh, again, there, there are no imminent plans to to hire uh, that, that vacancy at this point. We'll, we'll get to it eventually, but again, the priority is pools, summer employees, and some other positions. And, and do, do you know how often you guys update your inventory as it relates to technology issued out? I believe that when we got responses back, it showed that the former chief of staff still had a cell phone mm -hmm. uh, out, outsourced. Is that, is that accurate? Well, our, our, our former chief of staff is at another government agency. So it, it's just a process. And, and we're talking about within the last like 60 days or oh, 90 days now, uh, I think it's almost been like 90 days exactly. Uh, but what, what tends to happen is that um, when, when they transition to between government, right, between government agencies, it's a bit, it benefits the community for them to keep their cell phone. So what we'll do is we will transfer that cell phone uh, to that agency and then they will pay the ongoing bills for it. So it's not that he went to a private employee and he still has his phone. No, he's with another agency and we want constituents to still be able to reach him. So that's the cause for that. We, we have a very detailed process uh, when an employee moves on from the agency where before their last paycheck is released, you know, we're collecting technology, we're collecting keys, you know, computers, badges and, and the whole nine. Thank you. I think I heard from one resident, um, Mr. Uh, Pedro, um, he still said he's still waiting for a response um, as regards to two years not yet started uh, with the work at Kennedy, um, which in the Shaw community, are you aware of that? And is there uh, someone on your staff that can reach out to him or those constituents to give an update on that? Uh, sure, we most absolutely will. Um, that's that just for context, you know, keep in mind that that was a shelter. It was used to support sheltering operations. That building was released to DPR of August of last year. Those improvements were scheduled to begin in November. Unfortunately, that has uh, slid a bit and now it's scheduled to begin in April. And at that time, once those upgrades are complete, I've shared with Councilmember Pinto the, the dire condition of the restrooms, uh, need to upgrade that kitchen and knock down that wall to create that larger senior space. Those will, uh, when that occurs, we'll get back to comprehensive programming. We have done some special events the best we could, uh, you know, until those renovations are complete. So we'll, we'll make sure that uh, the community has that information and we'll reach out to, to, to that uh, ANC commissioner and that community to, to inform them of how imminent this uh, construction project is. Thank you. And can you speak to the issue of the trees being planted uh, at Jefferson Field that may uh, impede on the field and the upcoming construction? You know, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Wells and his passion and his advocacy. Uh, 
Uh, they, they don't impede. Uh, let, let me just share this with you, uh, uh, Chairman. We have uh, landscape architects on our staff that have decades of experience that have went to school for this, and we will respectfully disagree. The trees as is do not and will not impede the athletic play on that field, period. Now, with that being said, we have agreed to remove the trees, and we'll remove the trees once the construction starts, and that construction is scheduled to begin this spring. Got it. First, I, I want to end with this. I want to thank you um, and your team and all the workers of the Department of Parks and Recreation that endured so much and been on the front line caring and feeding and providing clothes and shelter and helping people to move to providing uh, Christmas gifts all throughout this pandemic. And it's been uh, admirable work and it, and it doesn't go unnoticed. And so I want to thank you for your leadership and those who work behind the scenes that may not get award, may not get called, who uh, is touching lives every day. And we appreciate you guys and what you are doing. You know, there's always room for improvement, as you know. We want to tug and push until we get there. Um, but I want to thank you, uh, Director Hunter, for joining us today and your staff. Um, a final note on this hearing. Uh, anyone cannot testify would like to submit written testimony to be included uh, in the official record, uh, you can email your testimony uh, to RYA at dccouncil.us. Uh, the official record is closed. Well, we close uh, January 31st, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Uh, the time is now 4.05 p.m. And this concludes this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you.